Hey everyone, welcome to Game Face, episode 248 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. This is the flagship show of our site, the world's most advanced gaming website. Here we are in the heart of March, the slowest March that I can remember on recent me- recent memory. Uh, February was slow. I had a medical had medical issues. We weren't able to do shows in February. We didn't really miss much. Here we are back in March, Matt. Still not missing much. <laughs> if you're nope. not watching podcasts. <laughs> It's really crazy, man. Like we have to start heck? like start like reviewing like indie games we missed from like the late 2020. <laughs> I I mean I've been considering all kinds of stuff this past week. I'm like, should I go back and like play some old games and see if like they still hold up today? Like just tons of featurey stuff, but man, it is crazy what's going on right. I mean, what isn't going on right now? We just <laughs> launched a brand new generation of consoles it's really bizarre i think like i don't think it is um not that part anyway like con- new consoles always have that like dead zone for you know three months after the launch there's nothing coming out for a while. what's it's unusual is that it's all, because it's what's unusual is that it's dried up for the old systems too right. usually you still have a flood of releases for the previous systems but i think the pandemic has just disrupted so much workflow that we've finally hit this point where nobody got any work done for a few months a year ago and we're feeling it now yeah i mean this generation is different though because games for last gen play on this gen generally just fine uh so my expectations were a little Mm -hmm. different and look you can look ahead you can watch dossier you know every month and figure out what's coming or not and i did and i worked on it with vincent and we published it uh but we've done that before and usually stuff just happens and it just hasn't been happening. We have put together, I think, a pretty good show for you guys today. Uh, we're doing our best uh, to try to get good shows out for you guys uh, every week. Um, and if you're uh, listening to this show out on the wilds of the internet on a, your favorite podcasting service, you want to support the show, head to patreon.com slash sifted. Sifted is supported 100% by patrons who we appreciate very much. I already see a bunch of people jumping in and giving us the Twitch Prime love. I saw Wampler13. He's hit 30-some months in a row. Um, it's pretty interesting because now on Pactor Factor, oh, and the hype train's already at level four. Sound Wizard hooking it up with the gift subs. Thank you. That's awesome. It's been interesting with Pactor Factor. We started um, putting people's Twitch Prime streaks in Pactor Factor. So it'll have their name if they subscribed and then how many months in a row they've subscribed. A lot of like our hardcore users don't do it every month. Um, I don't know how or why. Maybe it's just slipping their mind, but a lot of people who have been with us since the beginning or at like one month streaks, two month streaks, but not Wampler. Wampler's at like 30 months. Uh, and thanks again, Sound Wizard, for uh, all the subs. Thanks, my Minority Games, for all the bits that you're showering in our chat. Uh, thanks, everyone, for all their support in any way that you do it. Uh, thanks to our patrons. Um, our Patreon's actually up a little bit for the first time in forever. Uh, it hasn't gone unnoticed. Thank you very much to people who have uh, gone there and supported us. Uh, if you watch the show on YouTube, Head to patreon.com slash sifted. If you want to see this show keep going, that's the only way you can ensure that that happens. But anyway, I think we have done a decent job of getting a show together for you guys today. No real big games to talk about. I think we'll have Monster Hunter Rise next week. Is the timing for that going to work out? It'll be like right on the borderline, I think. A lot of it will depend on if I get early code or not from Capcom, uh, which usually we do. So we should be able to talk about that next week. And the embargo, obviously, will come into play there as well. Um, But I think we do have some pretty interesting stuff to talk about. A big... Thing that was in the works uh, this week finally came to fruition, and uh, that is that the deal between with Microsoft buying Bethesda finally went through for good, at least good enough so that Microsoft felt okay about promoting it. And promote it they did, Matt, with like an hour and a half long live stream. How, how far into that did you make it before you tuned out? Uh, like 15 minutes. <laughs> like there, there was, there's nothing of interest I'm actually in there. kind of impressed that you made it that far, Matt. Like it got in about 10 minutes in and I was like, wait a minute, they're talking to the PR person and she's talking about how she argued with like the PR person from Xbox. And I'm like, where is this all headed? Once Phil Spencer kind of clarified um, what was going to happen with Bethesda's exclusives, that was really the only information that they that they announced it in that thing, other than just a bunch of glad handing and saying how great it is to work together and yeah. this was a long time in the making and finally we've cons- consummated the relationship, that type of stuff. Um, and then Phil Spencer was kind of dodgy about what's happening with exclusives. He said some games will be exclusive to Xbox and PC. Um, how, what did you take that as, Matt? 
I took I mean, it as I took all, it as, <laughs> honestly. I took it as like, we're not going to take Elder Scrolls Online or Elder Scrolls Blades off of other platforms, but everything else we're keeping. Yeah. It sounded to me like anything that we're under contract to publish on another platform, we'll do it. We're not going to break yeah. contracts or we're not going to pay to break contracts, but yeah, everything like the, else. What you call it? Uh, what's the what's the time oriented shooter whose name I can never remember? Time oriented the D. shooter. Yeah, the timeline where you redo the timeline over and over again. Oh, Deathloop. They, yeah, Deathloop. Um, I kept wanting to call it Doom Scroll. <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah, I'm sure that'll stay. That kind of, but I think everything going forward that is isn't already kind of you know isn't already being pressed at the disc factory is going to be uh, a, a, what 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 they actually said was. Uh, platforms with game pass yeah um i mean really was, it's like he didn't even talk about xbox or pc he said no, it's just like do we have game pass on it then we have a presence on it and that's what we're going to sell it through so pc xbox what have you that the that game pass works on yeah it's interesting um, that his verbiage was these are exclusives for game pass it yeah. wasn't like he didn't say xbox or pc he said we got them for exclusives on Game Pass. Yeah, I mean, we for over a year, we've been saying Game Pass is at Microsoft's new angle. Yeah, It's what they're going to push. It's what they're going to consider their platform. They just want you in the ecosystem. And this is just more evidence for that. Yeah, I was still surprised, though. Um, because I mean, it, you don't spend $4 billion and not push it towards the thing you're putting all your weight behind. Whether what you're putting all your weight behind makes sense or not. I mean, I come from G4. We spent three years pushing interactivity on television. <laughs> it doesn't always make any sense, but when that's the mandate, you do it. Yeah. Um, do you, I don't know. It just seems it's, it's odd for me, having worked in this industry for so long, where it was always about the platform, a piece of hardware that you push to. Uh, and when you consider that, to me at least, for... Microsoft's pur purposes, Xbox Series X is going to be the vehicle that delivers Game Pass, I think, for most people. Um, maybe PC ultimately. Um, right now, it's certainly PC more than series consoles because everyone has a PC and people can't still can't buy an Xbox Series console for the most part. Um, but yeah, you're kind of rubbing up against the theoretical audience versus the actual audience on that one, I guess, because... The everyone has a PC thing is true, but at the same time, PC stuff is always a fraction of console when it comes to actual raw sales. But we don't know how that's going to translate to Game Pass usage yet. I mean, there's mobile to consider as well. I mean, everyone has a phone, and yeah, as powerful as phones but, are now, you can run a lot of stuff on Game Pass pretty well on your phone. Oh sure, I'm just I'm not going to play Forza Horizon Four on a phone. I mean, it's just, it's 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 a nice trick, but like I think you're right. We're talking mostly about the xbox for now yeah um but so I it's think surprising it's that pretty, it wasn't more of a push particularly in that presentation I, I don't find that surprising anymore that's just not been microsoft's focus for well over two years now like they're they're not going to try to make you buy an xbox they're just happy if you did kind of thing mm -hmm. um i'm not sure how successful that will be but like it certainly seems to be their their uh mo right now um, I, it does seem very likely that if you want to play Starfield or Elder Scrolls Six on a console, you are going to need to own an Xbox, though. I think that's the big question. I think that's what everybody is wondering. Is In Starfield, my guess is it's coming first. There are rumors now that it's coming out this year. Do you believe that, Matt? No. I don't not, either. Not for one second. Yeah. Um, I, like, I would like it to be true, but I do not believe it. I don't believe it either. Um, but do you think that if there is one game that maybe Bethesda does have a contract with another platform, it might be Starfield? No, because the negotiations with Sony for that fell through. Oh, you know that for a fact. Well, they talked about that already, that, that Sony was negotiating for Starfield to be an exclusive, and then the Microsoft sale happens, basically. Right, but that doesn't mean that there's some, not something in place for it to at least come to a PlayStation platform. Uh, I doubt that w that went through if the Microsoft sale started to happen in the middle of negotiations. Hmm. Um, I think I think Starfield will be Xbox only. Yeah, I Xbox think, and PC. I think Elder Scrolls Six definitely going to be Game Pass. Oh yeah, Elder Scrolls Six is barely an idea in Todd Howard's head right now. Um, you know, beyond like per concept art, I would think. But uh, yeah, Star Starfield, I think, will be. I, frankly, if I'm Microsoft, I will just buy those contracts out if they exist. Like, no, like you, you need to buy an Xbox to get Bethesda software's next big game. Like, that's it's as simple as that. And then, like, if I were Microsoft, that would be my 
like no questions asked strategy, like whatever we need to do to make Starfield exclusive to Game Pass platforms. That's what we do. And then, of course, the rest of the library. Um, do you remember that trailer that Bethesda put out that was like saving single player? Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember uh, we're that. showing that right now. Um, and that really is Bethesda's wheelhouse is, you know, single yeah. player driven games, something that honestly, Microsoft has kind of fallen short on this kind of like two puzzle pieces locking together in a lot of ways with these two companies. Um, I did see some ire on Sifted over the last few days from PlayStation fans who are, I think mm. they're starting to realize the finality of this now and the impact of this now that if they want to play these games, uh, they're going to have to buy an Xbox or they're going to have to get their PC to a place where they're happy playing games on it. And that's not mm -hmm. a cheap proposition. So for most people, it's like now you got to try to find a PS5, which is not easy right now. Mm -hmm. Well, but, luckily, most of them have spent a lot of time saying how Skyrim wasn't that good because it didn't run well on PS3. So yeah, uh, now they got their wish. They don't have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> uh, what do you think about all the games that just immediately went up on Game Pass? 20 games, like boom, yeah. right there. I mean, it makes sense. That's what you want. You want value for that platform. That's why you bought the company. Um, I also like that they put up a bunch of patches for existing games, backwards compatibility. You know, they put up 60 frames a second patches and 4K patches on, uh, I think, Prey, Skyrim, uh, Fallout 76, Fallout 4 on Series X. Like, uh, that's good support. Like, I kind of dropped that out of nowhere on Monday. Um, I would like to see them do that for Dishonored as well. Yeah. And then Oblivion but, um, looks and runs pretty well as yeah. well. Um, I will never play Oblivion again. Well, how but, come? Uh, yeah. I just, I just, I mean, I just ended up finding Oblivion very bland in the end. And I remember pushing myself through the final DLC to just get, be done with it. Um, I just, you know, I, I know uh, Skyrim gets a lot of shit, but I think it's a tremendous improvement over Oblivion. Uh, I certainly acknowledge that Oblivion was a step backwards in many ways from Morrowind. Um, and I will play Morrowind again, gladly, especially with mods. But uh, And I will play Skyrim again, probably in spite of myself. But I will never touch Oblivion again. Oblivion gives me that like same sort of like blase nausea that like other games I've played too much do. Like Fantasy Star Online does that to me too. I just um, so, uh, downloaded Fantasy Star Online 2. <laughs> mm. And I'm going to give it a go. Um, it's like the free game with gold this this month on Xbox. Oh, it's always free. Oh, it's always free? PS PSO 2 is a free-to-play game. But oh, okay. You, you pay for like, it's like ESO. Like you pay uh, for like, you know, cosmetics and stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I get the, the games with gold, like you know, little packs they give out for Fantasy Star Online too, but I've never actually installed it. I just installed um, everything. I'm going to try it. I have not played it at all. Um, and things uh, are so dry good, right now. I'm like, hmm, what can I play? It's pretty good as I understand it. It's just, you know, you have a lot of content to get through because uh, it's, you know, it's been out, it's been out for years and years right. in the East, yep. in Asia. So, um, you know, oddly enough, I did actually uh, play a little Skyrim this morning. Um I don't look. remember why. I don't. It looks, I mean, I, I haven't modded it within an inch of its life, so it looks very good. Oh wait, you were playing it on PC. You're saying? Yeah. Oh, I thought. You I mean, I do. I do series. also have it modded within an inch of its life on Xbox. I mean, you know, the special edition does support mods on Xbox. Now, another um, thing about this deal is that Microsoft um, might have a little more success in on a platform that it's really failed on so far, which is mobile. Right mm -hmm. now, we're looking at Elder Scrolls Blades, which hasn't done crazy well for Bethesda, but Bethesda has had a couple of mobile hits. And yeah, uh, it's done fine, and I, apparently, it's done pretty well on Switch. Um, I prefer it on Switch, frankly, because um, I, I prefer get to, to play use... anything on anything but mobile. To be perfectly yeah, I mean, honest. just because I get to use a controller it means it's yeah. better on Switch. Um, yeah, I don't mean maybe I don't. I don't, I don't know what else is there other than Elder Scrolls Blades. Like, um, Fallout Shelter was a huge hit. Oh, right. I don't even know if it is, people even play it anymore, but it did really well at least for a couple years. I just haven't thought about it in forever. Um, I mean, I don't play a ton of mobile games, but a lot of people do. Yeah. So, And then you start thinking about some of the games that should have done better for Bethesda but didn't, like Prey. All of them. Like a lot of them, but yeah, but like games like Prey or Dishonored, you know, going on Game Pass Wolfenstein. And, and staying there, which is an important thing. You know, we do Game Pass or Fail every week, and a lot of what we look at in that feature is, is this game so big that you're going to have to like kind of 
just power through it to get it done before it disappears off of Game Pass. <laughs> and to us, that's a detriment for Game Pass. Um, but when you have ga- like games like Prey and Dishonored that are there, and they're going to be there for good now, do you think more people will give them a chance because they're just kind of a part of the service? I mean, there's no real reason not to. At the same time, like some of those, I mean, there's a point where you could pick, you could pick up Prey, I think, on sale for like ten bucks, mm-hmm. or even less. Like, I think I got Prey and the Dishonoreds, like the Dishonored Collection plus Prey in some bundle last year on the Xbox Series X for or Xbox. Maybe it was one X. It was probably before the Series X came out. I think I got that bundle for like 15 bucks. Like it was nothing. Like yeah. they sell those games for pennies on the dollar at this point. Um, so on one hand, it's like, yeah, Game Pass makes it excel. On the other hand, like if you didn't even want to throw nine bucks at Prey, I don't know if you're going to spend the time to download it now, but you should because it's good. And now it runs at 60 if you have a Series X. Now, Matt, the, the next thing I want to discuss in this topic, inside this topic, is this past weekend, uh, we did a, a live Zoom call for Ask Shane Anything. And one of the questions that someone asked me was, kind of, what are my impressions of next-gen consoles now that we're four months in? You know, at first, I think we were in agreement that, you know, PS5 had the stronger kind of opening volley. Um, but they were asking, they're like, how do you feel now? Have things changed and I'll be honest, Matt, for me, things have kind of changed a little bit. I have I don't use my PlayStation 5 hardly at all anymore. I have found myself, as time has gone on, using my Xbox Series X more. Now, part of it could be the novelty of Game Pass, the fact that there's just tons of stuff on there to check out, and I'm always kind of just going there and, and looking around for stuff. Uh, but then the Bethesda deal happens, and there seems to be a lot more promise as far as exclusive games. I don't know if you saw it or not, um, but recently... They released some new screenshots for Halo Infinite that made the game look a lot better. Did you see those screenshots? No. Okay, they put out like five or six new screens for Infinite that were like jaw-dropping. I was like, Mm. oh, okay, that's starting to look a little more interesting now. Uh, Then you start Let's see a move. (laughs) And then you start thinking about all Bethesda stuff and Game Pass. Have your impressions of Gen 9 changed at all recently? Not really, because I have actually always used the Xbox more um, due to backwards compatibility and, and all that. Uh, the PS5 has always been, has been play stuff I can't play on anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, the difference is that early on, when the launch had just happened, there was a lot more you could only play on PS5, and I played that, and then I finished all that, and now I'm kind of back on the Xbox, um, which is where all my backwards compatibility stuff and, like, you know, it's just where I kind of settled. I'm used to it now. Um, I go back to the PS5 periodically to play. Um, mm, I play some Street Fighter. Most of my fighting games are on that, mm-hmm. so I will go back and play those. Um, but like the PS5 stays pretty idle these days. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking down the road and waiting for Ratchet, basically. Yeah, I mean, look, there's stuff like Returnal that's coming, but. Oh, yeah. A lot yeah. of that stuff that's coming, like, you can see already that those games are going to be five, six hours long, um, like the medium, you know, that lasted not very mm-hmm. long. You ca- get kind of excited about the games, and you play them, and you realize they're gone in a day. I played medium on Game Pass. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> did. Um, so Same with people- Outriders, and my Outriders is on Game Pass now. And I'm like, oh, that solves that problem. Yeah. Otherwise, I probably would not play that. Then you look at something like Kenna, and it's like, that looks cool. But that's also coming to PC, and it also probably is not going to be especially long. So you're right. You're kind of looking at Ratchet, which is coming in the middle of the year. And then what are you looking at after that? You're looking at maybe Horizon in Q4, maybe not Horizon in Q4. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at Kena, but, um, which, by the way, apparently was mispronounced in that. Yeah, how does Sony do thing? get that wrong? <laughs> like, that's not, that's not how the, the dev team pronounces it, Kena, apparently. Yeah, we, we, we actually had it right at the beginning. It's Kena. And then in the trailer, they were saying Kena for some reason. Like, Sony just got it wrong, which is not a good one. That was the other way around. No, uh uh-uh. In the trailer, Sony called it Kena. And the developers are like, no, it's Kena. So everyone was saying it right all along. Sony just confused people whenever they said it wrong in that Mm, trailer. I thought that was the other way around because I've always said Kena. No, that's incorrect. It's Kena is the correct way to say it. But anyway, um, so you're right. It's like Ratchet and then maybe Horizon before the end of the year. That's not a lot. So... I don't know. Like, as of right now, someone asked you, like, you know, they're both equally hard to get right now. But as of right now, 
if someone asks you, like, which of the two would you recommend to somebody, is your answer still PS5, Matt? Yeah, because PS5 is going to have uh, the exclusive stuff and probably the higher quality exclusive stuff in the long run. Um, and you can play most of what we're talking about on, on PS5 as well, despite the storage shortage. Um, I mean, I'm still in the place where if I could only have one, I'd pick the PS5 just because of Sony's own output. Um, but in terms of sort of a daily driver, the, the Xbox Series X has sort of taken over. Uh, but that is sort of um, that is sort of an embarrassment of, of riches situation more than something I would, you know, it's not like I'd be unhappy if I only had the PS5. I could do a lot of what I also i have been doing on the Xbox, also on the PS5. I've just kind of be, become accustomed to the Xbox uh, environment partly because I used the series the one X so long and also because I have actual storage space on the on the Series X. You know, I have three terabytes on difference. the Series X. Yeah, it makes a big difference. So. And you know, one reason the PS4 had a big advantage last time was its hardware was more powerful and easier to yeah. work on. Third party stuff looked better on PlayStation 4. That's not the case anymore. Like at the very least they're on equal footing. And then in some cases it appears Xbox looks a little better. In some cases PS5 looks a little better but they're both serviceable. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I start to think about, like, the exclusive stuff that's coming, and, you know, we were like, oh, we're going to have to wait until Halo Infinite on Xbox. Well, the situation's not that much better on PS5, let's be honest, although it did have at least a couple games at launch. Um, I think the question has become more difficult to answer in the last four months than it was at launch. Um, And you start talking about stuff like the storage and things like that. Um, Another interesting thing, I don't know if you watched one of the latest Pactor Factors, but Pactor actually gave up some MPD MPD data in Mm. a recent episode, which he probably isn't supposed to do. He got away with it by saying, I'm just going to give you rounded numbers and not give you the exact numbers. But he still said that in the opening like month and a half or two months of Xbox series on the market, they only sold like like a hundred million dollars worth of software. What they had sold like 20,000 games for series consoles because everybody is using game pass. Like people have got the message. They have figured it out. They're like, why buy games for this thing? I'll just spend 10, 15 bucks a month for game pass, whichever version I want. And that's all I'm going to do It's pretty crazy. How quickly Microsoft has got the messaging out there to the point where people are following it and they're not buying games. Mm -hmm. Like, Pactor was, like, completely shocked. He's like, look, I know that, you know, it's Game Pass and, and, like, core people know about it. But he was shocked at how many of the casual folks have already picked up on what a deal uh, Game Pass is and that they've started using it instead of buying games. So, I don't know, Matt. It's looking pretty interesting at this point. This is great, all great news, by the way, because we're going to talk about something a little later on in the show that may or may not have been influenced by some of the moves that Microsoft has been making over the last four months since launch. Um, to me, if if you had to, if you ask me which one has built momentum since since the launch of Generation Nine, it's Microsoft, undoubtedly. Um, especially after this announcement with Bethesda, where he, you know, Phil was basically like, "Yeah, you know, this stuff's going to be exclusive to Game Pass, so get on board." You know, it's. There was a little bit of ambiguity for a while where we didn't know. We're like, oh, maybe some of this stuff will come up. And they, the way they were messaging it, it wasn't very clear. And I think that's a mistake on Microsoft's part as well. But I don't know. I am I am starting to see a little bit of a shifting of the tide. If somebody asks me now, like, which one should I buy? I am now at the point where instead of it just being a no-brainer uh, with PlayStation, I will now ask, like, what games do you like? which hasn't really been the case for Xbox v. PlayStation for a while for me. So um, I think Xbox is doing a great job, and uh, I think they're making the right moves, and I think that now they're getting the right messaging out there, and I think it could pay big dividends for them in year two, year three, um, as the consoles become more readily available and you're not having to camp on Twitter watching Wario 64's Twitter feed trying to get one, which is still just insane, by the way. I've tried two more times since last week to get, like, my nephew, a PS5, and Pactor, it's just pointless. It's impossible. I've tried to get yep. graphics cards, too. I've tried to get a GPU this past week. No chance. It's it's absurd that you cannot buy something that you want to buy. But that's where we're at. Um, so I think it's a pleasant surprise for me that Xbox in four months has managed to pretty significantly shift my perspective on Xbox Series platform. Um, I really didn't expect it. Uh, even knowing that, you know, how long have we known about Bethesda now? Six weeks, something like that, five or yeah. six weeks. Um, even knowing that, 
Um, it's just in the last week, really, where I started to kind of perk up and be like, look at what's happening here. There's a changing of the guard, a shifting of the tides a little bit. Um, people, I didn't know if people would get on board with Game Pass the way that they have, and they have. Mm-hmm. I mean, those I still don't, it doesn't change my like recommendation or thoughts on current the current systems though. Like, yeah, be- it it might two three years from now when these games that we're talking about actually exist and are available. But like for now, if some if a casual friend came to ask me about it, I would still say PS Five without any reservation. Yeah, because there's like, not a third party advantage on Xbox. It's like they're yeah. pretty much on equal footing at this point. And you're right. Yeah. It's like which exclusives do you think are better? And I agree with you. I I would if I had to choose which exclusives to play. I would choose PlayStation's mm-hmm. exclusives. Um, and that might change down the road. Like, you know, maybe yeah. Halo Infinite turns out to be amazing. Maybe, you know, we're getting, maybe that Fable game turns out to blow everybody's yep. minds. Like, it's possible. Like, that could, that you know, there could be a seismic shift in that regard that at least puts them on somewhat equal footing in the exclusive realm. But we're not going to know that until 2023 or so. I think so, a lot you know? depends on when do these games come out. Right. I mean, if Microsoft really gets it in gear and we get Fable next year and maybe Starfield does by some miracle come out this year. I mean, if that were to happen or even next year, I mean, next year for Starfield would be entirely fine for me. Yep. Like part of me doesn't expect Starfield to like 2023. So like, you know, anything's better than nothing at this point. And I think that's really what I'm what I'm coming to the conclusion of is we've got nothing for either one of them really for this entire I mean, I year. Would, I still wouldn't call PlayStation Five nothing. It's just been a couple of dead months. Like you know, Ratchet's coming, Returnal's coming, Kena's coming, uh, Horizons at the end of the year. Like there's you know, I look at the PS Five and I'm like, well, you're going to have some really good stuff soon. I just think Returnal and Kena today, are going to end up yeah, being these really short indie like experiences that are going to be cool and maybe really fun, but they're going to be a flash in the pan where you play them for like a day, a day and a half, and you're like, now what? Um, something mm-hmm. like Starfield, big games like that, like Horizon, those games that you really sink your teeth into and take you like a week and a half, two weeks to get through, um, incentivize you maybe to go and play them again a different way. Those types of games, I think, are the ones that are really going to kind of put the the meat on the skeleton for these platforms. And I think it's a race yeah, now but to I'd... get the Avowed. There's a lot of games that are coming for both platforms. Oh, Avowed is so far away. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I bet we'll be playing Starfield before we play Avowed. I would probably agree um, with that, yeah. I mean, we, we, we've, we've been down the Obsidian Road before. <laughs> yes, we have. Um, that I mean, sounds I like the name it. of a game, Obsidian Road. Yeah, I wouldn't call, <laughs> uh, oh, I wouldn't call Ratchet a small game. Uh, no, definitely doesn't, not. Doesn't roll that no, way. Uh-huh. Yeah, I wasn't um, lumping it. It's, in it's enough. I mean, look, early on in this thing's life, you know, you're talking about one major game a quarter, and you're kind of good. Uh, Nintendo never really moves past that schedule most of the time, so that works for them. So, I think I think they're okay. Um, it's it's and also again, you can't you can't not factor in the pandemic you know, yeah. shuffle that's pushing everything back because now is the time when we really are going to start seeing you know, the results of delays from a year ago, you know, that, that three month period where everybody figured out from March to June, how to do all the work from home pipelines for this stuff. And, uh, you know, you even saw that in, um, uh, I think it was it in the, the credits of, uh, Raya, the last dragon, that new Disney movie yeah. where they basically have a big thank you to everyone who made this movie from home. Yeah. Slate and on their credit, you know, credits. Re- like, re- recent uh, financial report. It mentioned that like, Hey, now we're starting to see the the issues um, from the pandemic because mm-hmm. for whatever reason Sega wasn't able to scramble as well as a lot of other publishers and mm-hmm. it basically said like we're gonna have a lean year because now the chickens are coming home to roost. We didn't we yep. had a huge time period there where no one was getting any work done and right now is when those projects would be releasing or when we had scheduled them for release. Yep. So a lot of our projects have been shifted. You may not get them until the end of the year now, or you may not get them until early next year. Yeah, which is like, you know, like you said before, March is sort of the, March is like the whole, like, you know, a lot of fiscal years end at the end of March. So people are like, oh, get it out by March and you're good. Yep. But you're going to see, you know, lean years because a lot of these games are getting projects are going to fall out of that fiscal year. Yep. Um, which is, uh, maybe you know, next again, March will be awesome. It's, like, it's kind of like how, you know, I got, I got, friends who have or your parents who are all worried about you know, it's like oh the kids are going to be hopelessly behind in their education and i'm like why everyone's like, behind they're all on the behind. same <laughs> like they're all behind it's also like 
that, you know, it's like, oh, they did, like, you, you worried your kid didn't learn what he needed to learn in seventh grade. It's like, I don't, you know, I went to college with a bunch of people that didn't know what a thesis paragraph was. <laughs> like, they'll be fine. Yeah. I promise. Like, I think parents just want the kids out of the house and they're I think that is a lot of it. <laughs> yes. Um, they're like, I want my free babysitter back. Like, I can't take this anymore. Yeah. Like, like, I, like I said, uh, and not just for, for parents, but uh, the pandemic did force a lot of people to have to sit and look very closely at a lot of their life choices. Yep, absolutely. Um, so <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, so anyway, that's the latest on uh, Xbox Series and Game Pass and PC. I think things are looking up in general for that platform, particularly Game Pass. I thought the message messaging was interesting. Yeah. And like, um, I don't think I don't think Microsoft would be doing anything more right now. Like they're 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 a couple years behind where they should be, but they are doing what they should be doing. Yep. Like, I don't know what else they could do. And, you know, hopefully by 2023, we'll be sitting here and, and it, you know, probably the numbers game will still have PlayStation way ahead. But I think by 2023, we might be sitting here being like, like, wow, this is a really close race. We might have a real point. console war this in time, In terms Matt. of, like, quality. Because <laughs> like, they've both done like, a great job. Yeah. Yeah. It may be, like, a legit con- – we haven't had – when was the last, like, really close console war? I mean, three three sixty PS three wasn't a blowout, and PS three did find did close I guess the gap. At first, near the it end. was close, but then like then Xbox, Xbox just pulled away, and then, and then PlayStation uh, caught it at the way. Yeah, the PlayStation end. caught it eventually. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, look, it's been a long. T- I mean, the last real close fight technically was probably Genesis Super Nintendo in the early probably. days, and yeah. Super Nintendo pulled way ahead by the end of that. But um, the last time you really didn't know what the outcome was going to be was probably that gen because PS1 and PS2 were not competitions at all. Yeah. Like that was just Sony ran Blow away. Yeah. Like Sony just took off like a fucking rocket and you yep. never saw them again. And it was, you know, left to Sega, Nintendo and, and uh, uh, Microsoft and Nintendo to fight it out for second place. Um, we have, you know, this could be a real, you know, and again, numbers wise sales wise sony did it again i mean like xbox is probably not going to catch them yeah, playstation wise. 5 is the fastest selling console ever yeah in the history of video game consoles yeah so everyone who said console gaming is dead and eh, it's yes, the like, fastest well, selling console i've been mocking ever. people who say that for a decade yeah. now so <laughs> it's a you know, I mean, I mean, it's, it's spanking. Packer can keep trying to make fetch happen on that, but it ain't happening. It's spanking like, the switch. Like I'm surprised that it's like whooping the switch. Even like, it's crazy. Um, we'll see and if I it gets sustained. When the, ne- when the not the next, not the switch. You know, the switch refresh, stupid thing, whatever this is. But when the switch two or whatever it is comes out, I bet you'll see records set by that too. Like it's possible. People want the actual unit in their house. Yeah, and I also think stay, with yeah. Game Pass, you know, games like for us, like Dishonored or Prey that we've already played, there's a 12-year-old, 13-year-old kid who just turned 12 or 13 who has yeah. never played those games. Um, the back catalog that Bethesda is offering on Xbox has a lot more mm-hmm. value for them than it does for people like us. So it'll be mm-hmm. interesting to see how that kind of impacts and shapes the race. But it's just exciting to have two worthy competitors going toe-to-toe. Mm-hmm. It's going to uh, make it better for everybody. Did you see a uh, slight tangent, but did you see, uh, was, uh, was, it, was it Imran? I think Imran Khan was that. He's was talking about it because they said that Super Bomberman or whatever, the Bomberman on Stadia, which was exclusive to Stadia, is going to come to other platforms. And I think it was Imran who said, uh, he said, a, a Stadia representative looked me dead in the eye and told me that no other platform could ever run this game because of Stadia's advantages. <laughs> and here we are again. A Bomberman game? Okay. A bomber. That something guy needs about to educate the cloud himself. thing. It was something something about how the cloud thing worked that only that only Stadia could run the Bomberman game. And it's just like Which just shows you the crap that what? was getting shoveled <laughs> onto oh, his yeah. doorstep to get him to pull the trigger on Stadia. Yeah. And now he's like, oh crap. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. All right, let's move on. We're gonna talk next about what was undoubtedly the biggest debut from this week, as far as games are concerned. Uh, a game called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. It is a spiritual successor to an arcade game that I honestly had no idea was as big as it is. Um, even oh, people. Oh, my God. It's, I'm shocked, Matt. Like, obviously, I loved it, and I, kn- I know you loved it. But, dude, like, it, it. first of all, this is, like, one of the most watched things 
on Sifted in the last month. Mm-hmm. It is one of the most commented things on Sifted in the last month. It is a that, that Ninja Turtles game was a touchstone for a generation. Like there was, there is no com- there's no com- comparison. There's no comparison. Like that is the defining Konami four player beat 'em up. Like no question. Like I know for us it w- it is, but like people who are younger than us, it seems to have resonated with them just as strongly. Like did they oh, yeah. did they play it in the arcades like we did? No, they no they played it on on Nintendo. Super Nintendo. Or- they played on no any the arcade game came to NES. Uh, there was a 360 uh, or Xbox Arcade version. Uh, there was the Hyperstone Heist. There was Turtles in Time. There were there were versions of and sequels to it all through the Super Nintendo uh, era and the Genesis era. Um, and all that's you know, but a lot of the younger people today like they got handed down those 16-bit systems by their parents. That's true. Um, like you know, yeah, absolutely. And and the other thing is, of course, Ninja Turtles as a brand has never gone away. Um, through all these years. And even if you are, you know, into the early 2000s Nickelodeon version or whatever, you can still play those old, the old 80s and 90s stuff and recognize the characters and understand what's going on and, and you know, get into it. Like you don't need, that's the, the thing that Ninja Turtles has been pretty smart about is they have never, they haven't continually reinvented the, the wheel. Um, they've just sort of slightly updated it and put it into new art styles, but you can always go back to those original turtles and it still pretty much works. Um, the other thing that might have been part of it is like the, the modern versions of the turtles have had crossover stuff with the old eighties versions hmm. at times. So that might've brought some of that, some of them into that. It's like, Oh, what's these other versions of the, you know, cause you know, they, they have different tones, but they have, they, they're all the same characters more or less. Um, so yeah, and of course this game is, is just one of those things, you know, even when we were kids, I remember like, I, I knew people who went to the arcades and never went to the arcades or went to the arcades just to play this Ninja Turtles game. Um, and it was a staple of like family fun centers for years and years and years after most games of, of that era went away. That's like a good you, point, Matt. Like you could go to movie theaters like 10 yeah. years after <laughs> later and there would yeah. be one of these cabinets there. Like early two thousands at the Metreon, I remember like it, one of the theaters had the theater there had one of those that is you can see that cat with that that stupid, you know, half assed April O'Neil cosplay with a giant fright wig and the camera <laughs> on the side of the side of the arcade machine. Like I, I remember you passed by that every time you went to the snack machine. Um, but yeah, it was uh it's it's just one of those ubiquitous arcade games that ever ever you had that or you had an NBA jam or uh the Simpsons game. Those four player games made made bank. The X-Men game. X-Men, yeah. Was that six players though? X-Men could be six players. Yeah, that yeah. was a six player version. Like that game stuck out to me more than Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for some reason. Well, X Men was first, so it was probably more unique at the time because they had that was sort of the the beginning of the the Konami beat 'em up thing. Yeah, here's here's a here's my uh, unpopular opinion. The X as someone who read X Men for forty years of his life, um, that X Men game is not very good. Yeah, I know it's not. Um, it's 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 clunky. The the combat is unfair and designed to kill you as fast as possible. The super move drains your health, which is ridiculous. Um, the Ninja Turtles game is infinitely better. Um, it's it's uh, the, the, the X Men thing was just unique because I'm like I was like oh my god I get to see Wolverine in a video game which was weird in 1988. There are also some strange characters that you could play as. It wasn't all like Mega Star like X Men. Well, it was all based on the uh, the the X Men Pride of the X Men com- uh, cartoon, which was meant as a, a pilot for an animated series that never happened. Interesting. So that was the, that I was did the not team. Know that. <laughs> yeah, so that was the team in that because that was more or less the team in the comics at the time was uh, Wolverine Psych. Cyclops, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Dazzler. Um, Dazzler being the one that nobody knows now uh, because she was very popular in the 80s. She began as a roller skating glam pop star queen. I remember uh, that. And um, and vanished at the end of the 80s, like just disappeared. Why is that? Uh, she was she well I mean in universe she ended up in the mojo verse with long shot and wasn't seen forever uh in the real world it was because disco was out and no one knew what to do with uh Allison Blair anymore um so uh and they just sort of shunted her in another dimension and didn't mention her for another 10 <laughs> years um she's back and, and in stuff now but like for a long time she was gone why do you think teenage mutant ninja turtles have endured because the concept itself is pretty absurd. I mean, they're like yeah. they're like human turtle things that are ninjas. Like they're they're monsters who do cool shit and eat pizza, and like that's about all you need. Um, <laughs> really? Is that really all you need? 
Apparently. I mean, all you need is a hook for kids to like think that they're cool. And for whatever reason, kids like monsters, kids like ninjas, kids like teenagers who do teenage stuff. And that, you know, Ninja Turtles hits them all. Um, you know, and they all have different person. That's the other thing. They all have different personalities. It's a, you know, yeah. it's a team thing. Everybody's got different colors. You can, you if, can you know, see you have, yourself you know, if you're, if in you like, one of uh, them. Tinkering with stuff, you like Donatello and science stuff, or if you like, uh, uh being sarcastic like Raphael's funny if you if you like being a goofball Michelangelo is the class clown if you if you're I don't know why you'd like Leonardo actually I don't, I don't, I don't, he was kind of the oddball you're right you like swords you like Leonardo I guess I don't know um I mean I guess Leonardo's the diligent hard-working one so if you're a but if you're a diligent hard-working kid why are you watching cartoons um go go do some math but uh, I, I think it's, you know, and they've got the mentor thing. And it's, you know, it was People an early version saying, Leo's of, great. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, Leo is my favorite in the old comics. So I'm not, I'm not dissing Leo. I'm just saying in the, in the version of the, of the turtle, because I, I, here's the Leo secret. Leo is a straight man. That's what Chad's saying. Leo is definitely the straight man. Yeah. Um, but here's the secret. I actually read the Ninja Turtles comics before they were anything before they were the com- the cartoon came out. I think my, my cousin would get me stuff and I read the old black and white ones where they murder the shredder in the first issue. Right. <laughs> um, and, th- and like just hack everybody. The, 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 the original comics were straight R rated daredevil. Yeah. Homages. They're hardcore. Like, in fact, the, the origin of the, their origin is tied to daredevil. Um, Cause daredevil's origin is that, you know, he uh, he pushed the old man out of the way of the, the runaway truck and a, a, a canister of experimental goo flew out and hit him and hit him in the in the face and blinded him and Which gave him the so powers absurd. <laughs> in the Ninja Turtles origin is is he did that a, a blind man did that and saved this guy and the, and the canister bounced off his head, rolled into the sewers and mutated four turtles who had been thrown in the sewer. Oh, right, right. So that's why Splinter's name is Splinter, because uh, Daredevil's like master, master martial arts master is named Stick. Ah, so uh, Splinter, Splinter is of the a stick. splinter off the stick. Interesting, uh, and it's why the the ninjas he fights are they fight are called the foot because the ninjas the daredevil fights are the hand. Ah, wow! You learn was, something was, in every episode of Game Face. Yeah, it was all a, <laughs> it was all an homage slash parody of the Frank Miller Daredevil stuff. That is interesting. Um, and then they got then someone noticed that, that like oh this thing sold out and what did crazy so we're going to pick it up and turn it into a kid friendly franchise. And uh, Eastman and Laird made a lot of money. I bet. That. I mean, they still are. Um, I'm guessing. Uh, no, they sold. They've sold. Eastman sold his stake in it to Laird in the '90s, and Laird sold his off to um, some other company. I think Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon owns them now. Wow, that was um, a big mistake. So he sold. I mean, they got, they cashed in. Uh, Maybe pretty, they're like me, and they're like, "Why is this thing so popular still?" <laughs> I mean, I've seen interviews where they pretty much say that. And like Eastman left fairly early because because he didn't want to get stuck doing that forever uh, for the rest of his life. I can understand. Uh, Laird that. stuck with it longer. Laird was into it more, um, and uh, and but eventually he was. I mean, those guys are actually kind of old now. There's like it's, it's time to cash in and, and not worry about these pizza eating turtles anymore. And it was all. I mean, they were they were so huge. Like they were. You cannot. I mean, they defined the transition to the '90s really, and you cannot. You know, there were all those like weird uh, parodies and like and ripoffs, adolescent radioactive black belt hamsters, uh, stuff like that, which actually got their own cartoon show. And like, you know, there's a whole wave of like mutated, you know, animal heroes, you know, street sharks where Vin Diesel got his start. Oh, right, right. Um, they sparked off a revolution. Yeah. Biker mice from Mars. And a lot of that stuff did come from comic books. Um but yeah, it was uh, Ninja Turtles really defined the transition to the '90s. For, you know, off of you know the '80s stuff, Transformers, GI Joe, Gem, all that. Um, Ninja Turtles defined Ninja Turtles along with Power Rangers defined the, the early '90s stuff for kids. Uh, and I think part of that was a team. Like you, you had a multicolored team, and yeah. it's not a coincidence that that Power Rangers is still going too. Like that formula just works. It does work. And I also think that every kid can see themselves in yeah. one of the four characters. Yeah. They're like, that one's me. That one's me. No, this one's yeah. me. Like, and I think one of the other things that helps, and you saw this a little bit in the original live action movie. That was another thing. Is yeah, the, the live, live action, action movie being so a hit. Bad. Like, 
that stuff broke out hard. Like the back of the live action movie was a huge hit. Like no one expected that. Like I remember that it was it a big shot. <laughs> my, my, I remember because my, my dad was a giant movie fan, followed the industry all the time, got Daily Variety, the whole deal. Uh -huh. And I remember him coming in when they, that thing swept at the box office. He's like, that stupid turtle thing you like uh, <laughs> won the box office this week. I don't know what the hell's going on. Um, but uh, the other thing that, that 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 movie did a little bit, but more and more as you went forward, especially in the 2000s, they emphasized that the four of them are brothers. Um, like it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a cohesive family mm. unit that splinters the father figure and like April, sort of the, the sister best friend thing. Yep. Um, and with Casey, Casey Jones in there as well. Like that's a big deal. And it's something that kids identify with very readily. Um, and even older ones do. I mean, it's not a coincidence that one of the big themes through all the big blockbuster stuff, especially the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is the idea of chosen family, mm. which is one of the one. Of, if you if you want to if you want to like bond with a millennial, chosen family is one of their big things because so many of them grew up in weird homes, um, and and only found a place to fit when they grew up and got friends of their own. Right. Um, that's why that's such a big deal in mass media right now. So the turtles kind of uh, were ahead of their game on that one, and I think that's true. Also, if we're talking about this this video game. Uh, you play four players and it's fun yeah and then the other thing too is the turtles always kind of impart themselves into pop culture they break dance yeah. they skateboard they surf they do do you remember when they went on the concert tour that's right <laughs> coming out of their shells <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's really bizarre uh, yeah it's, it's but you know what it's strange. like this is a this is an ip that if i'm a parent i'm okay with my kids getting into it like i don't have yeah. an issue with it there's really nothing controversial about it it's a well unless you're in the uk uh, where they were uh because they in the, back then the uk was not cool with ninjas they thought ninjas were the, the gateway to, to all youth delinquency <laughs> and um so the, the name of the show there had to be called uh had to be changed to teenage mutant hero turtles and um and uh, michelangelo was never allowed to use his nunchucks so they cut a lot of the nunchuck stuff because the nunchucks were nunchucks were outlawed there and it was a big deal it was a big like deal with like street gangs were killing people with nunchucks or whatever it was like it was a big moral panic thing there and that's why when it moved to the cbs when it, when it got really big the syndicate and the syndicated thing moved to like a bigger the big time and all that um they started in the, in the post first wave syndication they started reanimating michelangelo never used his nunchucks again he used a turtle themed grappling hook as his That's weapon crazy. so that they could air it uh uncut in europe matt i don't know if it was like this for where you went to school but in the 80s were ninja stars like a huge thing yes like oh yeah kids would bring Everybody them to wanted school ninja stars kids would yeah. bring them to school and yep. they get suspended and thrown out yep. like everybody knew how to make these origami paper yep. ninja stars did you mm -hmm. and like some like the crazy kids would put like stick pins in the end of them yep. and like throw them and hit someone and it would stick in them and then they get thrown out of school like yep. it was like this thing where like the schools had to send out like a memo to parents yep. being like don't let your kids bring ninja stars to school <laughs> like, yep no that, that was that was that all happened when i was in elementary school <laughs> i didn't yep. know if it was just like my area but it, it was huge. no it was, it was that whole it was that wave of ninja cinema that every you know that uh, it was it's really uh, weird the show, the show Kasugi stuff, the Master Ninja stuff, Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja Three, The Domination, uh, American Ninja, uh, all that stuff. Like, yeah, no, that was that was a, the Ninja boom of the '80s was a real thing, and that's one of the reasons that the Ninja Turtles were what they were. And nunchucks, um, nunchucks were like for the oh yeah. your older brother who was in high school had the nunchucks. Like I had a yeah. ninja star, but like all the older kids on the school bus had the nunchucks. And sometimes they would hide them in their school bags and bring them to school. And like they'd just show them to you on the bus and be like, yeah, don't mess with me. I got the nunchucks. Like, yeah, we had those. A, we a had, weird had time to be alive. And they were like kids who made their own out of their own sticks or yeah. the, like bamboo <laughs> and shit. Like, it. it was just. <laughs> It's so funny, but that's the way it was. There was, we was always like, one. There was one kid at school that had a. He just had a bike lock chain. They took the the plastic <laughs> off, and he called it a kusari fundo. And I was like, "That's just a bike lock, though." He's like, "Yeah, but it's the same thing—a weighted chain." I'm like, "I guess." I don't, yeah. <laughs> it was funny, man. The stuff that we got into <laughs> in the eighties. So Michael weird. Dudikoff has a lot to answer for. It. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh man! So anyway, there you go. Uh, Teenage Mutant, Teenage Mutant, Mutant Ninja Turtle. Shredder's Revenge. It's coming mm. to like Looks everything, great. like all platforms. Um, there's no hard release date other than it's coming before the end of the year. Uh, but as Matt just mentioned, it is four player co op. Uh, you can hack and slash your way through the game with bros. And of course, it's going to be online, so you don't have to have people sitting next to you on the couch, which is a good thing as we're trying to work our way out of a freaking pandemic. 
Um, but I think this game's going to be huge, Matt. Let, let's say you. Oh yeah, I think it'll be huge. Like there's there's no demographic really that th- this doesn't appeal to uh, right now. Um, it'll be a good play with your kids game. Yeah. Um, looks great. Like uh, the trailer's great. The I got I got nothing but love for this thing. Like it's re- a really good way to update things. Andy T. Monahan says there's a classic classic South Park episode where Butters gets a ninja star in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a thing. It was and those really guys grew thing. up where I grew up, so yeah. So there's there's your proof that they they lived it too. And the funny thing is, like those ninja stars were all crap. Like if you oh, threw, yeah. if you threw them, they wouldn't stick in anything. They just bounce off and like fly yeah. off into like the corner or whatever. Like well, I remember the one we had one kid who like got the fancy origami paper with the silver on the other side. So oh. he folded it right. It would look it like looked a metal like star. Real. And he tried like intimidate people with it. And we're like, that's paper. Is it? Yeah. Was, <laughs> it was good times, really. It was, but like you never, you're on the school, you know, recess. You just didn't know who was going to threaten you with weaponry. It was. Uh... <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, okay, so we're going to go from Matt and I's childhood to the childhood of current children, and we're going to talk about Roblox. Roblox. I think it's Roblox. Is that the way that Roblox. you say it? Roblox. I mean, I've always heard it. Roblox. Yeah. So, Roblox just went public on the stock exchange, and it. <laughs> It its stock right now is at like seventy dollars. It it ended up at like seventy five or seventy six. It's come down a little bit since uh, its IPO. Uh, GameStop money. But it's yeah exactly. <laughs> but it's literally like worth like five times Bethesda and like three times Take Two and like eight times Ubisoft. Like it's insane the value of Roblox right now. And so I was like, what the hell is up with this thing? Like I admittedly. I mean, I knew what it was. I knew it was like a game creation tool that kids play and, and, and like because all my nieces and nephews love it. And my sister and my brother talk about how their kids, they have to pull them away from Roblox every night and they'll cry and scream and blah, blah, blah. So I knew the basics of it, but I didn't know like the details about it. Like what is it about Roblox that would make it worth that amount of money? And so... I did some investigation this week, Matt, and I still, I'll be honest with you, I have no idea why it's worth that much money. It's a it's basically it's Little Big Planet or Dreams for Kids. Mm-hmm. It, it's a game creation tool, but really the difference other than the fact that the tools are more simple and kids can kind of learn how to use them is that you can make money from the stuff that you create. And that's where I think probably its valuation is high. I still don't quite understand why it's worth seventy five dollars a share or seventy. I mean, it's, it's sort of that's why it's it's high because it's a universally loved kids thing and nobody understands why those universally loved kids much like Ninja Turtles. No one understands why this weird thing is suddenly super popular, but they know there's probably money to be made there, so they're going to invest in it, and that's why it, that's why because because all the stock stuff, as we know, is mostly imaginary. Um, so if people believe it's valuable, it is. Yeah, that's all it is. I mean, that's really what I mean, stocks are. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, honestly, uh, a, the pretty, if you want a pretty good primer in uh, in how nonsensical, but more or less how it works, go watch Trading Places with uh, Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Eddie Murphy, um, really? Were they? Uh, you ever seen that? Yes, it's hilarious. Yeah. So at the at the end, where they do the whole short sell stock thing. Uh, now they do, that's that was done in '82, so they do it on on the floor with paper and yelling, and people are screaming, and there's a news broadcast. Everybody stops and watches. It doesn't work like that anymore. It's yeah. all computerized. But what they do in the climax of that movie is pretty much what happened to GameStop. Yeah, it's it's roughly the same idea. Um, so uh, it, it's it's and it's fascinating because at one point Dan Aykroyd's character explains what they're doing. And it's a pretty good primer on how this stuff is happen. how this stuff is imaginary. And if you really know how it works, and if you have your timing is perfect and your luck's in, you can manipulate it to your advantage. Um, so there's always some of that happening here. Is Roblox really worth that 70 bucks a share? Right now it is. Not, yeah, like, it ima- it if it's imaginary, then sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> but- um and, and it's also key to remember that like the I mean, stock value has very little real-world significance to the operation of the company. Like, 
you know, I had friends who were worried that like when GameStop stock went back down to where it went, like everybody who worked at GameStop would lose their jobs because oh, yeah, yeah. the company would crash. That's and not I'm how like, it works. No, it's like the company's going to go on the way it always it has the whole time. Like nothing is going to change on the ground level of this. And they're like, well, what does that mean? I'm like, exactly. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, like, well, it's like <laughs> if you watch like Apple stock, Apple, <laughs> this happens every time. Yeah. Apple issues its quarterly report and they're like, <laughs> we killed it. Oh my God, like we made like three times what the analysts said we were going to make. We destroyed every metric and their stock tanks. It's like, Mm -hmm. what the hell? Like it makes, you're right. Like the performance has really nothing to do with how a stock performs. My Mm -hmm. question though is, is Roblox something that's going to generate the kind of revenue that a Ubisoft or a Take-Two or an EA, it's bigger than EA or an EA is going to generate. Like I just don't understand how... It, people, you're right, it's imaginary, but people do imagine in their minds that this company's going to make a lot of money, and that's why I'm going to buy its stock. Yeah, um, I mean, part of it is because, like, um, look, I don't have a friend with a kid who hasn't talked to me about Roblox. Yeah, my, me either. They're like, All my nieces so, and, and, and that can have an influence, you know, if these people, you know, these guys don't understand, you know, they don't follow games, they don't follow toy stuff, they don't follow anything, but they've heard every kid they know and every kid their kid knows say Roblox. Or so like, they've already put big. their credit card into Roblox yeah, so their kids can buy stuff. they probably spent a lot of stuff. money on Roblox, yeah. Yeah, and they're spending um, money on it, so they're like, everybody else must be spending money on it. Right. But when you dig into it, it is a big, literally a big pile of crap. Crap. But the advantage here is that most of the people investing in this are never going to play it. Matt, I think I could even get B-roll for this. Like, (laughs) because there's nothing. They're just, it's just one broken thing after another. And, like, their curation is, like, as bad as, like, the Switch eShop. Like, the getting the good stuff to bubble up to the top. Like, what a five-year-old kid thinks is cool is, like, a thing where you just like pet a dog it, and then mm. the hearts go up from the dog's head. Like it's, it's so I bizarre. will say that, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how much contact you have, probably no contact because of the pandemic, but like contact with Gen Z kids. Yeah. Not like much. my niece, my niece, who's like about to turn 13, their humor is different. Um, As in not funny? No, the <laughs> thing is they, they are funny, but they're not anything I would ever come up with. But but I think they are closest in tone and attitude, maybe as a generation too, to, uh, to like us, the Gen X point of view. Like um, that is one reason I think they have so much friction with the millennials right now is like millennials have this, you know, the, 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 the meme is that like the millennials are like, it's like, you know, the millennials are walking around depressed, like, oh, nothing matters and everything's terrible. And uh, the Gen Z kids are like, everything's terrible and nothing matters. Like it's like to them, it's freeing, <laughs> you know, it's like, like right. they're, they're, they're nihilistic, but they, like, they have know the, that they, it, they can the do same whatever things, they want. But they look at it from a different perspective. Right. Interesting. Right. And, and a lot of their humor is like, like the whole, the current thing, the argument now is um, Gen Z going like, oh, center parts only. Like side parts are terrible. Yeah, I like heard side, about that. What say. the hell is that? From, from what, from my informants <laughs> in the Gen Z, from my informants in the Gen Z community, that is almost entirely a gag. Like they Just know to like the, make fun of their parents who the have a side part they, or whatever. Right. Well, that's the thing is like, they're sort of <laughs> taking advantage of I this like idea that. that they that they're like like oh millennials still care what seventeen year olds think of them even though they're thirty two. <laughs> so like we're that. gonna fuck with that. They're trolling real hard. That's funny. Um, they're yeah they're trolling, but they're trolling like at a younger age than you think someone would troll someone that much older than them. Like <laughs> they grew up in the internet. They yeah. they have shit posting in their veins. I mean like, they've had a phone we, we in have, their hands since they were I mean, four we as like, well. Like like Gen X raised a lot of these kids. Yeah. Uh, we have created this Monsters. new creature. <laughs> And we have no idea what it's going to do next, but I bet it'll be hilarious. If you watch a lot of TikTok stuff from the younger kids, their sense of timing and sense of humor is A, on point, and B, different. And like, I don't know how to describe, but it's like how, it's like how when you saw South Park for the first time, and you're like, this isn't like anything else. Mm -hmm. Like I see the influences, but it's like something as something's different here. Or when you watch like, 
space goes coast to coast yeah. for the first time. And you're like, what is this? Yeah. Like that's the feeling I get when I watch some or see some of the jokes my niece tells me or think it's just like that. I mean, and like, I've had to readjust on my expectation. I'm like, okay, so I can send you some real weird shit and you'll just sort of <laughs> yeah. absorb it. Like it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like, I don't need to worry about getting too meta. Uh -huh. Um, we're talking about a girl who, when she plays Civilization VI, does historical research on the figures in that she's her computer opponents in the game in the real world, so she can insult them better <laughs> when she like makes up stories about how she killed like Attila the Hun. And well, stuff. I it's think I think your niece is too is too old, honestly, for the Roblox crowd. Like all my nieces and nephews, she, they're she's like a little old, five she, to like nine or ten. She's a little old, but she knew of it. Like yeah. you know, Roblox has been around a long time. It has. Like, Roblox yeah. has been around, been around a while. Yeah, like she, been. she knew, she knew of the Roblox. She didn't really care about it because by that age she was already into actual electronics and programming. But like all my other friends who have kids who are like eight or nine, yeah, like they've been into Roblox for like five years. Now, Matt, why do you think Roblox has kind of hit this sweet spot, but other games like Dreams or Little Big Planet never really kind of got over the hump? Uh, I mean, Roblox is on uh, everything and is very accessible, and they had like actual physical merchandise in stores pushing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was all the key to it. Uh, Dreams and Little Big Planet are both trapped on one platform. Uh, Little Big Planet's creative level stuff is you know, absurdly complex. Uh, kids could not do that. I mean, um, have you looked at the tools in Roblox? Like, I checked them out, and, like, they're not that simple. <laughs> like, <laughs> but for kids who grew up in Minecraft, like, they're, they're a natural, like, sidestep. Like Minecraft like, is easy. Like this actually has like scripts and things like that. So like, does Minecraft if you want to build them that way. Yeah. Like that's the thing is like th like Roblox actually does streamline some of what Minecraft can do brute force if you're interested in that kind of programming through the kind of visual object stuff. Uh, yeah, there's and a, a lot language of kids that Roblox side, is in. It's called a lot like of kids Lua. sidestepped into that. And uh, I mean, this is I'm just telling you what's. The, the facts here yeah. like this is what they've said to me okay. like as for, I've, I've never played roblox but i know what they're what like they like it and that's what they what's the, what they say or at least what their parents say they said um like to them it's not that complicated but like something like dreams probably wouldn't be but they don't know what dreams is because they don't all have playstation 4s right they do have mobile phones you know like part of it's a lot of its accessibility like roblox is just ubiquitous and dreams and little big planet frankly are not yeah i mean because you're right, like, my nieces and nephews will play it on the iPad, they'll play it on the PC, they'll play it on their cell phones, mm -hmm. um, and you're right, Dreams is just on a console. Um, I'm, I'm surprised, though, that it hasn't taken off more than it has based upon how popular Roblox is, to be honest. I mean, part of it is there's just, there's nothing to tell you Dreams exists. Um, and obviously it's not, that's not a factor so much anymore because of the pandemic, but you know, you just see Roblox sitting around in a toy store or a or department store or whatever, and it would catch the kid's eye and they'd get into it. Like that's sort of how it works. There's dreams has nothing equivalent. You have to basically accidentally hear about it from a friend or like dig through the PSN store and find it. You know, like how would you hear about dreams? They don't advertise it. It's not on billboards or buses or TV commercials. Like, like dreams is almost entirely word of mouth. Um, for an older audience, for the, for the most part, like you know, you, you basically discover dreams through. I mean, I discovered dreams through knowing someone who works on it. Like, yeah. you, you know, it's it's not a, it's not a. Yeah, you know, it should be bigger. Like you're right, it should be 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 more known because there's stuff going on in that game that no one is aware of. That how I mean, you know. There's stuff that I could show you. Know, we could show you videos of stuff from dreams you would never guess was made in dreams. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's, but every time it's, I see something made in Roblox, I know it was made in Roblox. Right. Roblox is, <laughs> is, is a very specific set of building tools. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. The animation's but crap. Some, like everything about it is just crap. But like that's kind of the – that's kind that's of the, the thing, joke. I guess. That's kind of the thing. Like it's, it's kind <laughs> of the thing. It's like it's, it's, I, it's hard to explain and like you either get it or you don't. I don't really get it, but I understand what they're doing. I don't get it in terms of Roblox, but I've – gotten things like that. it's like why were we so into garbage pail kids it's stupid they're stupid like it was it and was homies. ridiculous <laughs> or homies or like um fucking jelly bracelets who gave a shit about why do we care about jelly bracelets but that was a big deal for a long time um why do we care about ninja stars yeah like, <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> you know you will about ni robots but they can't kill anybody <laughs> Yeah, I was just, um, I was, I'll be honest, I was disappointed to see that all my nieces and nephews were falling for 
just garbage. In all yeah, I mean, I, I expect. I guess I expected it to be more like a Disney Infinity Skylanders thing, yeah. and it's just it's just more of a rudimentary construction tool. And it's just junk. It's like most of the games, it's like the character does one thing, like he just flies mm-hmm. up into the sky, and it's over. Like that's all it is. It's. I mean, what it is 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 basically like a game where you build your own fidget spinner. Yeah, that's actually that's a really good way to put it, Matt. That is. Based upon my two days worth of kind of look sorting through mm-hmm. all the crap, that's pretty much what it was. Like yeah. really short experiences, or a lot of it. A lot of the popular stuff was like, let's go to a pizza shop and <laughs> and choose like the stuff that I want to put on my pizza, or mm-hmm. let's go to like the animal shelter and pick out the dog that I want to rescue. And you just walk in a room and there's like five horribly animated dogs. That kind of look like dogs on a counter and you pick one and it goes rough rough and that's it like that's mm. like i was just like man this is what's captivating that, the like, kids you know these are these are you know eight nine year olds expressing themselves through this yeah. like that's that's a thing that you know it probably took them days to make that yeah. but like that's <laughs> oh, a thing it's a thing they captured and did and yeah. it's a short hop from that to like programming classes yeah you know? i mean like I, it's, look it's i a, like that it, the kids are interested in this at all Oh yeah, um, it's better than a lot of million other things that could have been. Yeah, enjoying, I don't think like you're, you're taking not selfies stick with of themselves right. or whatever and being narcissistic. So, uh, being creative that is good. I like that my nieces and nephews are kind of dipping their toes into that kind of stuff, and like you said, dipping their toes into programming and art mm-hmm. and all these other parts that go into making games. So yeah, like I don't think they're still gonna be playing Roblox when they're in college. Yeah, um, not like Pokemon kind of thing. You know, like maybe like, that's or, what dreams should be doing. It's trying to figure out a way to graduate the kids from something like Roblox into dreams. And maybe that's what their target should be and what they should be doing instead of trying to get people like us who have jobs and are busy and maybe we have kids. Um, we're probably not the people they should be promoting stuff like dreams to. You agree with that? Maybe. I mean, I, I think dreams is, is appealing to anyone. Like, Cause I yeah, don't make but, stuff I mean, in dreams. Market, I just go and play it. Successful though. Yeah, but I, I don't know. Like they seem to be doing okay for what they expect them, themselves to be. I would just like to see Sony promote it a little more readily. Yeah. Like I don't know, you know, if they, you know, I guess you'd probably need an excuse for some big update or something. Um, but it doesn't seem wrong. I mean, I honestly don't know when you where you do that. Like you're not going to buy a Super Bowl ad for Dreams. Um, but uh, that's the thing is like there's nothing in stores or whatever to sort of promote it the way Roblox has these sort of tie-in things. Um, or Fortnite, even for that matter. Fortnite yeah. has action figures now. Yeah, we're gonna get to um, Fortnite here in a bit. They've they're doing some crazy stuff in Fortnite right now. Yeah, no, don't know. I mean, in terms of like the value of Roblox, like uh, it's 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 just one of those like you know it's hot and everybody talked about it or I've heard my kids all talk about it IPO things where they think you know there maybe there's money to be made here and if there is we'll make it and if not it'll go away and we'll move on to the next thing. It's it's just the stock market being the stock market. Yep. Uh, so anyway, that's Roblox. We just I, I I jumped on the grenade for y'all. If you were wondering like what's going on with this, why is it so popular? Now you know why it's popular, kind of. Um, I still don't know why it's that popular. To be perfectly honest with you, um, I just think it fills that niche of like kind of that stepping stone building slash programming thing that nothing else does. I mean, there's probably like you know educational software you could get that does similar things, but like Roblox is already popular, and if you do make a thing. I think part of the key is like if they make if you make a dumb thing where you get to go into a pet shop and pick a dog, like you can then have all your friends play it. Well, they said that some kids have made almost a million dollars off of their goofy little games. And the other thing too is that they make their money off of microtransactions, Mm -hmm. which I thought was a little a little slimy. You're getting the you're just getting those kids in there right right in the door of the microtransaction world, preparing them for whenever they want to play, which our next topic is FIFA Ultimate Team. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> You're just preparing them for the cha-ching to come. And that actually transitions nicely into our next topic, which is EA Gate, which I think might be a little bit overstated. Um, usually when something is called whatever gate, it's actually a big deal that people, everyone should be paying attention to. Uh, I would not, I would argue that that is not the case with EA Gate. And if it were not a slower week, Game Face would probably not be talking about EA Gate. Uh, but it is a slow week. And this is one of the biggest stories of the week. In fact, if you look at a lot of the uh, the commentary stuff on YouTube, pretty much every single one of them has done something on this already, including Jim Sterling. Um, and essentially what happened is an EA employee was caught selling 
FIFA Ultimate Team items on an illegal black market. So these cards, these rare items that uh, you either have to earn because you're opening packs, you're buying packs and opening them like Pokemon cards, um, and you're hoping that you get this rare. Someone working at EA who has read, 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 readily access to these types of items was going onto this illegal black market and selling them to people and got caught. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, Matt, is there any way to stop this from happening? I mean, I'm surprised he got caught. Are you? I mean, I don't know what their protocol is with that, but uh, I would imagine that you're generating those items. There'd be some way to find out that that's happening, like that you wouldn't be able to control as as that person. Um, you require someone to look at it and notice it, but uh, all that stuff clearly has some kind of a record for it. Um, and I guess the solution is to have more than one person watchdogging that, because otherwise the watchdog might start selling things on the black market. <laughs> Now, EA said that... Who watches the Watchmen? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. the, the, obviously, the big concern is that does it throw off the balance of the game for the people who are out there grinding, trying to get these items, get these cards, these players, these kits, all the kind of stuff that you get from Ultimate Team. Does it throw the balance off? And EA said that, like, the the type of cards that this person was selling represents, like, 006 percent of all the cards in ultimate team so ea is not all that concerned about it throwing off the yeah. balance for people who are participating in there's it. no like, way that, that this was happening in the volume required to shift the actual balance of the overall game yeah um how do you feel about paying lots of money for stuff like that i mean i think it's dumb but if you want to <laughs> if you want to do it it's your money you know we're going to talk about something similar later in the show we so. are yeah absolutely <laughs> But Matt, do you think that do you think that this is kind of a byproduct of things like Ultimate Team and microtransactions that is just going to send kids down this path where they're doing stuff like this? Well, I don't think these are kids doing it. I think these are adults doing this. I'm talking about the kids that money. are that want the stuff so badly that it generates a black market for it, so that people like the criminal at EA starts injecting these black markets with the stuff that the kids are hoping for, asking for. Like what? Well, these cards. Like, if the kids weren't so addicted to Ultimate Team... I don't, I don't think these are kids. I think they're adults buying these. That are, that are on the black markets buying the stuff? Of course. Yeah. I guess, like, maybe you, they're buying kids. They have, like, when I say kids, I'm the... not talking about, like, five- or six-year-olds. I'm talking about, like, a 13-year-old whose parents are like, sure, here's our card. And I'm talking about the people doing this are probably in their 30s. Really? They're the ones with the income to burn, and they're the ones that, like, get weirdly competitive about shit. Yeah. Huh. I'm surprised that you would think that. Um, to me, I'm I think— I'm surprised it, you would think the other way because really? kids don't have that kind of money. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think it's the kids who get their parents to just give them a credit card because the parents use FIFA as the babysitter so they don't have to get a real babysitter. No, I, th- I think it, I mean, probably some teenagers doing that, but I think the majority, majority, majority of people I see throwing tons of money— at mobile games, microtransactions, and weird stuff like that are all in their late 20s, early 30s. Doesn't it seem like EA should be able to police this very easily? Shouldn't there be some kind of a digital fingerprint or something and some kind of a an accounting of that digital fingerprint that says this is where it came from, it's either legitimate or it's not, it's either been issued legitimately or it hasn't been, and if it hasn't been, there should be some kind of a filter in place that says, uh-uh, no, 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 this is an illegal card or kit or whatever and it should just stop like it i mean you could build that system but it feels like a kind of a lot of waste of money and time for something that's only going to happen very infrequently and only if a, an employee decides to risk their job at doing that i'm talking more um, just about the black markets in general not this particular case where an ea employee was the one who was kind of injecting well, i'm not sure what the black market would be able to be without an inside contact well, you're, you're, no, people have been trying to sell their legitimate cards on mm-hmm. these black markets. Like, a lot of people just sell legit ones that haven't been sort of obtained in some sneaky or, or weird way. Well, I don't know how that is. You trade cards or whatever? Yeah. Like, is that, that anyway? Well, there's no way to stop that, no. Like, if you're going to use an actual, if you legitimately have the, car, the valuable card and you want to you know, go outside the game and take somebody's money and then trade them the card inside the game, like, nothing, you know, 
theoretically that's against the EULA if you have a thing that says you know you're not allowed to sell this stuff for money but how you, you can't track that like you can't you know i guess what i'm getting have, at is they haven't done anything directly against the 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 game's rules in the game so you'd basically have to be you'd have to have a separate like kind of ea interpol task force just tracking down people selling you know, outside and like, you know, that's just secondary market shit that happens with everything it happens with comic books, happens with trading card, real trading cards, it happens with every, you know, Pokemon cards. You know, that's the same thing you know, to me. It's the same thing as paying thirty five, three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a Charizard. You know, like it's it's just it's a ridiculous price and it's a ridiculous practice. But secondary market value is a thing, and I, it's going to happen even with digital if, stuff. If Ultimate Team didn't exist for FIFA or for Madden or for NHL or any of EA sports games, then it's the root of the problem. And if it didn't exist, then these black markets wouldn't emerge and none of this stuff would be happening. You wouldn't have kids spending, and again, kids 13. You don't have kids doing that. It's adults. Um, (laughs) But like kids aren't doing that. You're not, people aren't spending thousands. Kids aren't spending thousands of dollars on FIFA cards on the black market. Adults are like that. These are, these are people with jobs and people with income. Um, some of them are kids, but you know, I'm sure, you know, like you got these like weird, you know, uh, you know, if your kids making a million dollars a year on Roblox, maybe you are spending that much on FIFA cards in your, in your spare time. But, um, I mean, yeah, I guess if you take away the thing you use the card in, yeah, the black market for that thing goes away. Cause there's no thing, but like it would, there's, you know, that happens with everything that is rare and gives you an advantage and a competitive anything. And look, um, I know EA is never going to end it because they're, they make more money off of ultimate team than they the do off the sales EA of the game, do, but. The only thing EA would do in response to this in the long term, I think, would be to sw- shift the cards to this to the NFT model, like we've been seeing with this like art laundering thing that's been going on, yep. uh, so that they can sell stuff for inflated secondary market prices themselves. Like if you make the cards identifiable, individual, electronic, non-duplicatable objects, like with this NFT thing, then. EA can put things up like that on the market and see what they sell for. And you've got a real money auction house. On That's your going hands, the, the other direction, Matt. I'm trying to figure out a way we can go the other direction. Um, but you, I mean, truth is, it's just not going to happen because EA it's makes way happen. too much money. That's off. just, that's how reality works. Like that's, you know, that's, it's like I said, like that's how comic book works. Anything that's, that is a rarity or is, a, is in demand, or especially like with the Pokemon cards and Yu-Gi-Oh cards and magic cards, you know, that Black Lotus magic card has been out of print since the nineties, but you can still spend tens of thousands of dollars on it. Cause it's still a good card in a competition. Um, that's just the, that's just how it works. And if there's a card in these games that, that people think is going to give them an advantage, someone is going to pay a premium to not have to go through the, you know, in the end, because like a lot of times the price for that kind of thing isn't just calculated by how valuable the card is in terms of competition. It's calculated by how much money you'd spend trying to get it legitimately. Oh, I get it. I, so, I totally understand it. But I'm saying, like, why does this need to exist inside a video game other than a way to squeeze more money out of the consumer is my point. Um, and I feel uh, like things like Ultimate Team have trickled down to create these environments where you have people involved in these black markets and – in all honesty, if it wasn't for Ultimate Team, you probably don't have like the whole microtransaction system in a game like Roblox because it becomes normalized by companies like EA and it makes other publishers feel like, well, if they're doing it, then it's okay. Next thing you know, you have microtransactions everywhere and not all of them are bad, but sometimes they do end up in dark places like these black markets where people are getting... I don't know. It, it just. I mean, I don't. I just don't see what you what you're talking about with the black market being a weird, dark place. It's just eBay, basically. It's an illegal like, eBay. Because you're not. I don't know, here's the it, thing: it, EA it, does not condone the reselling of cards. You're they not, don't condone it, but I don't think that makes it illegal. Like, I don't think that's an illegal act. I think it's just against the rules of the game you sign when you agree to go online. That's not. That's not the well, same as illegal. Yeah, I mean, you're they not could ban get you from the game if they whatever. found out, but you're not going to get go to jail for it. Like that's not illegal. Um, so like, it's just you know, it's just the nature of the game. Like if they can find a way to make, I mean, you could take trading out of the game. Like it's about it. Like if you can find a way to make it so players cannot trade cards with each other, that's basically the only way to stop that. Yeah, and maybe that is what they need to do. I don't think they need to do anything, frankly. I think it doesn't matter. You don't think there's a problem with it at all? My pro- I mean, I have a problem with a guy who works at EA, like making money for himself, selling, you know, internally generated rare cards. Like that's, that's shady. Um, but in terms of like, if there's a way to sell this thing and trade it over to somebody, that's, I don't care. Like, 
like I don't see what the pro what the harm is there really, other than taking advantage of people with too much money than more than, more money than cents. Um, like they know what they're getting. Like EA is not having anything stolen from it. Um, I mean, there's I a doubt. reason that there are agencies like the Consumer Protection Agency because some yeah. people need to be saved from themselves. Let's be honest. Oh yeah, but this is this is not. I mean, EA's problem with this is that they're they that's money they're not getting. Yeah, they're not getting and that's the, money the end for of it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder like, why EA not, hasn't like done EA's that. Why has EA really... not created its own marketplace for it? Um. I why haven't know. a I mean, lot probably, of publishers probably done because, that? Like, because this is a problem with like you gold do, and even MMOs. Even if you do that, and... even if you do that, it's going to still be cheaper to go through an outside source because then EA will not take a cut from the sale. Mm. That's a good point. You still, you would think if you made a decent marketplace, like even if you're talking about like MMOs and gold and mm. stuff like that, I mean, you could shut down these sweatshops that have people working like eighty hour weeks grinding gold and MMOs. Yeah, but RPGs. they don't, and you can't. That's that's the key. Like. That still happens. It happens all the time, and you can still go out and buy. You can, you know, but look, if it's built into the game, like only a percentage of people, I think, are going to go outside sure. of that ecosystem. Like it would cut I mean, down on the, it a lot. That's the iTunes of theory. If you if you make it easier to get it legitimately or in house, people will stop going to pirate things because the pirate stuff is more inconvenient than just getting it through the proper channels. Um, which I guess is possible, but like if EA goes through the trouble to, to make that in those games, I think they just open a whole other can of worms where people are saying they're exploiting the player base for, you know, because it's like, well, if you think that's so valuable, why don't you just like put put more of those cards in the in the mix? And then that value goes down and people don't have to pay as much for it. Because um, that's the thing is like, it's, it's an artificial scarcity thing if they start taking advantage of the secondary market themselves. Another analogy might be like weed legalization. For instance, like in California, it's like when it was getting ready to happen, people were like, oh, no one's going to go to those dispensaries or whatever uh, because the prices are going to be like higher. And, you know, why would somebody go in and when they already have someone, they're getting it? Well, if you drive around L.A., you see the lines outside of the dispensaries like that hasn't mm -hmm. stopped anyone. I mean, the other part of it, too, is that maybe people are like, well, I feel safer coming here than going on the black right. market. So what you're saying is if we opened a shop that just sells black market FIFA cards. No, no, no. That I'm would saying be if you had an official shop that is like governed by an official well, agency like EA. Well, don't well if don't it, forget if it's like EA's those, shop. And you, well, you don't forget like last what I'm saying the, the dispensary thing isn't a very good analogy then because it's still federally illegal and there is no supervisory body for that. Um well, it's, I mean it's, it's regulated regulated by the state level but it's still illegal on the on the national level yeah. no one's going to come after you for it but like it's you know it's sort of, it's it's an even more illegal thing than selling a fifa card is what no, I'm saying. that's not what i was getting at though i was just talking about culturally how people think mm -hmm. and they're like i feel like i'm safer coming here than getting it from somebody on the street and i'm willing to even pay a little more for it here to your point about ea taking its cut I'm willing to pay a little more for it here knowing that I'm safe because the other part of this is the people who bought this stuff from the, that guy at EA, their accounts are getting banned for good. So going to jail, so to speak. Um, so there, uh, that's the analogy I was getting at, not mm -hmm. the legality or illegality of it, just the risk yeah, reward of it. I just don't think the black market thing matters at all. I think that you know, the gate, the gate here, EA gate or whatever you want, it's more of an EA whitewater. It's this isn't it's not a not a big deal really. The the the, the scandal here is that someone who worked at EA was yeah. feeding the black market, you know, illicitly generated ca card keys laced. basically. <laughs> like yeah. laced weed. <laughs> yeah, basically. I mean, he was he was he was growing his own whatever. He's growing his own rare cards. I wish I knew enough about <laughs> soccer to to pick a popular player or something and say Neymar, but, yeah, Messi. Sure. But, I'm like, he's growing his own Man U cards, and it's not okay. Um, I don't know. I don't even know if they're in FIFA. I have no fucking idea. Yeah. But uh, the black market's always going to exist in that regard. Um, unless you can make EA it smaller, just, though. I think, and I think EA should probably just take it over itself and, and establish its own. 
that's probably the only answer because we know EA is not going to get rid of the cards because no, they make the too much cards money. Are, the cards are lucrative whether you go after the black market or not. Like you know, they're already making money off of it because because uh, they they probably don't even mind the black market that much because any for the outside of what this guy was doing, anything being sold on the black market was already bought from EA. So right. who gives a shit what they do with it or, or yeah. earned by playing the game? Yeah, right. Like EA already benefited from everything that's on that black market. So um, it's just, you know, to me, it's not really any different than reselling a Funko Pop for more money than you paid for it. It's, you know, it's, it's scalping to some degree, mm-hmm. but like it's not hurting anybody unless you're ripping people off. And that's a different that's a different issue. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I think a lot of people would argue scalpers do rip you off. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a avid concert goer. I would argue I've been ripped off many times by scalpers. Well, <laughs> this, the concert, I mean, like, I, it's hard, it's funny because, like, I will, if I can't get a, a toy or an object or whatever, uh, you know, at retail, I will pay a higher, you know, scalped price if I have to, if I don't think there's eBay. any other way to get eBay's it. eBay's entire business is scalped. But I have a harder time doing that with, like, tickets for something because I always feel like, putting a price on that experience is a harder sell for me. I was like, there's no appreciation for, for event tickets. It's like, it's like if you buy something and you've owned it, you've had it for 20 years and you've held it and it's value appreciates. That's one thing. Concert tickets aren't like that. That's not how it works. Like, or even like tickets for anything. It's just like, it's like, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get to see Hamilton another time. Right. Like I don't need to pay $1,500 for this ticket. Um, Whereas, like, and also, you know, that's not so much anymore because Broadway finally figured out they can just charge 500 bucks right. for good seats <laughs> yeah. and not let everybody else. You know, that, there's, yeah. there's a good analogy for this. That's true. Because yeah, that for a long time, you know, Broadway tickets used to cost like, you know, 30, 50 bucks, 70 bucks for orchestra. And like people turn around and sell tickets to Hamilton second row center for like $500,000 a piece. And like somewhere around uh, when Hamilton started to blow up, Broadway was like, why aren't we what charging if we that? We just charged five hundred dollars <laughs> a ticket. What if we people will pay it? So why don't yeah. we just charge it? So they analogy. did, yeah. and now it's much harder to pay to pay for good seats at Broadway. But the people, the theaters, make a lot more money. Yeah. Um, Which means that is a lot, obviously, a lot easier than building a digital marketplace for your sports games. Yep. But uh, it's a uh, it's a thing that will always exist, one way or the other. People will always, if you if you have a desire for a thing that is in short supply, someone will sell it to you for a premium. That's true. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about Fortnite. Um, we don't talk about Fortnite very often, only when there's like a huge paradigm shift with the game. And this week, there is a huge paradigm shift for the game. Although it feels this like... Chun Li's ass. <laughs> <clears throat> well, here's the thing about Fortnite. So it started That's out... That's the only thing I saw about Fortnite in the last couple of weeks. Oh, was like really? They put, they, put out, they put out the costume of her in the training outfit from like Street Fighter Alpha and the, the character model... Uh, someone paid a lot of attention to her lower half over an epic. So, uh, well, we know people who work there, so <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe our friends yeah, who are I the got, guilty I party. Call Seth, and be like, dude, was that you? Yeah, I'll say <laughs> this: it giving, is funny. Anytime something happens, parameters with, over there. I don't know if you do this, Matt, but anytime something happens with Fortnite, I always wonder if it's one of our friends who was like behind it. Do you Every do once that? in a while, I see stuff where I'm just like, that. I mean, like, like there's, you know, I know you that so many friends that work input. there that we're just like, it could yeah. be one of them. Like, totally. some, also, like, sometimes, like, this this current thing, the zero point thing, I'm like, is that Hoffman? Yeah, exactly. Like, Hoffman likes stuff. Like, I know Hoffman knows sci fi concepts. I mean, I know he's not the only one. Like, there's a lot of nerds over here, all the places we know, that all these places that people work at. But, like, some about this, this storyline screams Jeremy Hoffman to me. And I'm like, did he, was he in a meeting? Did he suggest something? And this is how it ended up? Like, I don't know. I'm suspicious. Well, Fortnite is crazy because it started out as like primarily a single player experience where, and it was really Mm -hmm. just about building your fort. It was like a, basically tower defense defense game. game. Yeah. Yeah, You built your fort, you got attacked and you tried to survive the night. And then it morphed into this battle Royale phenomenon, which is what most people know it for and how it really blew up. Which was now, basically put in as like a one-off sort of like on a lark. Hey, we made this yeah. sort of mode. Yeah, like, like hey, it was it's this thing that we fiddled around with. What do you guys think? And people were like, oh, my gosh, it's like groundbreaking. And then it, you know, obviously spawned things like Call of Duty Warzone and all these other clones, um, Apex Legends, all of it. Yeah, to and, the point that no one even remembers it was PUBG. It's true. Originally. Exactly. And PUBG is really the one that started it. And yeah, like when this, when this, when Fortnite's, you know, this mode came out, it was like, oh, we made our own PUBG. Yeah. 
That's, like that was the point. Like yeah, we made now PUBG is like one of the small players. If you think about it, it's been eclipsed by like a, four other games. And PUBG has a Dead Space clone coming out. So right. Yeah, exactly. Life's weird. Well, <laughs> now Fortnite has come full circle, and the new season of Fortnite is kicked off by a single player element where you play it by yourself without anyone else. Um, it's called, what is the name of it? It's, it's like, it's chapter or season six, chapter two. Like I can't even keep track of the crap. Yeah, I, don't remember, I don't remember what number we're on. There. It's like the way that they name everything. It's hard to even keep track of it anymore, but it is a single player experience. And it, finally it appears that Epic has decided that the blonde haired dude is in fact the main character of Fortnite. He stars in this thing. This is a trailer for it. <clears throat> what, what do they call him? His name is, oh, what is it? Oh, Agent Jones, apparently, is the blonde guy's name. No, he that's is now the, the star of Fortnite. And that's important because this is a single player only kind of kickoff to the new season. Now, the new season itself is typical Fortnite. It's you play in Battle Royale, and they release skins throughout the whole season. But they're starting to tie the skins into single player content. And that's the trailer mm -hmm. that we're seeing right now. Um, have you, when was the last time you played Fortnite, Matt? When it came out? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think, I don't remember. <laughs> well, we're years. starting, we're, years. what it is, years is we're, ago. we're starting to see the master plan of Fortnite coming together because Throughout the year, they release all these skins, and you're seeing them in this trailer right now. You're seeing mm -hmm. the Terminator, you're seeing Kratos, yeah. you're seeing. I mean, I appreciate all this. I love that like they, they they're like Fungo Ryu. Pops. They just license everything. I saw a clip of like aliens running around with Ripley shooting things with machine guns. It's hilarious. Master like, it's, Chief. It's, it's, they're all in this fun. one cinematic. I mean, it's really amazing. Star Wars stuff. It's the only place you'll ever get Marvel versus DC. It's crazy. In a video game. What Epic has managed to pull off with these IP. With this IP, all yeah. these IP. Because it's more valuable to them to be in that game than to not be seen alongside their competition, which is so rare. I mean, you just saw like, Ryu throw a fireball power. at Master Chief. <laughs> like, if you, uh, all you need to do to, to illustrate how powerful and all-encompassing Fortnite is is to say Marvel and DC let their characters be seen on the same screen together. Yes, and it's unreal. That's it. All these properties, though. You just saw Kratos and Master Chief in the same frame. Like, yep. no, that's never been done before. And now we're starting to see why, because they're starting to tie all these characters together into single-player, story-driven content. Um, and that's exactly how the new Fortnite season kicks off. There's a very short mm -hmm. campaign that you get to play through. Yeah, and, and they flirted with this before, you know, the Galactus thing, the thing where the robot came to life after the whole season and fought the kaiju and changed the map. Like, but it's all team-based. Like, you're playing with everybody else who's playing for Right, time. but, like, they've toyed with the, the whole narrative thing before, kind of affecting how the team-based game works. Um, this feels like a very natural next step um, into kind of making Fortnite something everybody wants to play, even if they're not in the, into uh, multiplayer stuff. Yeah, but, well, here's the thing, Matt. It's kind of a a bait and switch or a Trojan horse as it were, because oh, yeah. for now, for now, do you think that this is something that they're going to expand upon? Because I mean, it, I'm sure it depends on whether people how their feedback goes on it. Um, but if there's an interest shown in kind of making this a, you know, having character driven elements to this, this game going forward, I'm sure we'll see more of it uh, as we go forward. you know, like the Fortnite's strength, Epic strength on Fortnite has been its ability and willingness to respond in almost real time to what the audience wants. Yep. So this campaign is only about eight minutes long. You can't <clears throat> die. It's basically just a cinematic that you run around through. It's it's not like gameplay intensive. Um, you play as actually you play as Lara Croft through most of it, and it's really here's here's how insignificant it is though, Matt. They posted the gameplay walkthrough on their YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. They're like, don't have to play it if you don't want to. You can just watch it if you want to. Um, so how much significance do you think it really has? Or do you think that the players of Fortnite even care? Are they just wrapped up in this world and they're cool, they're cool with just seeing all these different characters in one sort of like pop culture experience? I don't know. I'm sure that's part of it. This seems like a test balloon to me. Just like put it up, see what, see how many people play it, and you know putting it on the YouTube channel is pretty smart because then you're, then you're like, okay, our control on this is that if you if you want to see it, you can just watch it on the YouTube channel. 
but if you if someone goes so you know if someone goes and plays it they were actively interested in playing this kind of content so you get actually a more uh, i think you get actually a more useful metric from that by Matt, doing that what do you think will do you think more people will play it or more people will watch it i have no idea uh i i don't really know anything about the fortnite audience at this point so i really don't know what the, what they'll pick my guess is that most of them won't notice but uh I don't know how high engagement is for the Fortnite audience with like all their social media and kind of their, their one-off stuff. But I have to imagine it's, it's pretty big because they follow that stuff to find out what new characters and skins are coming. So maybe, I don't know. I don't even have a guess at that, but if but they must have predict, made this for it? a reason. So Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't, I would venture to guess more people would play it because I think people will figure out it's not that long and mm -hmm. they'll be like, ah, oh, I might as well just play through it instead of going to YouTube and watch it. But I don't know, because the Fortnite audience is is honestly different from any audience that I'm familiar with. Because I'm not a Fortnite player. Um, they will go there and they will watch like a virtual concert with everybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if the fact that you're not with other people, if that's a detriment to the Fortnite I fan. It, I don't think it necessarily matters. Like, like I said, that kaiju thing with the robot, that was not multiplayer. I mean, you could be in there with other people, but you couldn't kill each other or fight each other. You're just all standing there watching yeah, it, it happen. Yeah, it was non-interactive. Yeah, it was just a yeah. thing that you watched. So, you know, if, if they want to see the next chapter of that or whatever, I, get, I mean, I don't know how, how narrative intensive the world of Fortnite has become. Um, seems like they're trying to push it in a direction because it seems like... You know, they've already got action figures and stuff like that. It feels like your next step on this would probably be like animated series or, you know, that kind of thing. Someone's got to be talking about a Fortnite movie in the in the hallways of Epic somewhere. Um, and you got to have Agent Jones for that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> we'll chat see. is all like they're obviously not huge Fortnite players either because we're all a little bit older and they're all like, what the F? Because <laughs> like, it's crazy. I mean, you're just seeing like every like pop culture icon in like the frame at once, and it just I don't know. I mean, it it seems cheap to me uh, in a way to sell skins. I mean, I guess that's how I look at this. Is like Epic has figured out a way to sell skins by you know getting all these pop culture icons into the game, getting people to pay for them, and now this is just kind of their cheap payoff or cheap way to rationalize what they've been doing with all these characters. It doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. The narrative doesn't make sense. Although no, hardcore I mean, Fortnite been, players, I mean, they're grasping it straws me of the, trying to figure uh, it out It reminds how. me of the cheap narrative t trick they, that DC and Marvel pulled for their DC versus Marvel miniseries in the 90s. Yeah. Um, which made, it made no sense, but the point was to get the DC Marvel characters fighting each other. So no one cared. Like it was, it was, it was just to get you there. And if they want to do that here, fine. Like it wouldn't surprise me if someone, some, some of the people, maybe even Hoffman, in the depths of, of Epic are thinking of that DC versus Marvel series and saying we could do something like that. Cause the DC versus Marvel series got very, Cosmic meta as well. Like there's a lot, there's some quantum mechanics happening there too. For example, um, Vincent just mentioned in chat the big new skin for this season is Lara Croft, and also yeah. I think Neymar, actually the soccer player, is like the other big one. Oh no, okay, which is weird. But I thought, I thought you were gonna, you thought you said Neymar the Submariner. I was just like, really? No, Neymar. Neymar. That's, a, that's a deep player. Marvel cut. No, ne um, Neymar is even weirder, to be honest with you. Yeah, I guess so. Like a soccer? What? I mean, I get internationally they'll probably sell a billion of them or whatever because everybody oh, loves yeah. Neymar. Um, but is there a Tom Brady? Can you be Tom Brady? I don't think you can. There's an NFL crossover, but I don't think it's like you can be specific players. I think you can just wear the the uniform, the jersey, yeah, of okay. your favorite team um, on your existing character that you create. I believe. <laughs> but if you if, if you but, offer a uh, if you offer a Gronk character that just yells Gronk, <laughs> I might buy it that. It just spikes shit like really hard. <laughs> it spikes up and goes Gronk like that. I, I would, might buy I, that, I, Matt. I might actually I, buy yeah, that. I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to fight a team just of, of that. Bronx. <laughs> 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 That's pretty funny. But so there's your, there's your next single player narrative thing. It's a, it's a, a <laughs> waves of Gronks coming at you. <laughs> so Lara is the big uh, skin for this season, and you you play as her in this mm -hmm. like single player thing. So. They're they're definitely trying to move skins with this stuff. Um, it almost feels it feels a little bit like putting the cart before the horse. They're like, we're getting all these skins, we need to sell them. How can we rationalize it? Oh, let's come up with this flimsy narrative that we can try to make it seem like it was mm. all part of a master plan. Sort I, of. I mean, it's also kind of like a demo for the skin. Yeah, right? I guess like, so. It shows it off for sure. And like to some degree, Lara might need that more than like, you know, the Mandalorian. Like it's it's a it's maybe a harder sell in the sense that like she's not really pop culture hot right now, 
Um, but it's, you know, that's, that's fine. If you want to do a little, like, little, little eight minute, 10 minute, like playable thing for each of the new licensed skins you do now, that's pretty cool. Like that'd be a nice thing to get with your money for the skin. I mean, it's better than what they've been doing, which is just right. putting the skin out. Yeah. <laughs> it has no context whatsoever for why it's in there. Like, I guess it yeah. does make more sense. Um, and I think for Fortnite players, they probably just think it's fun and it's like a nice diversion. It's just yeah, I'm, it's a nice little extra thing. It's like as an outsider to Fortnite, I'm always trying to figure out what the hell is going on with it. Like, why are people into it? Why am I not into it? I'm a, I love shooters. Like, it should be something that I enjoy, and I just don't. Like, there's just nothing really that resonates with me for about Fortnite, and I keep struggling trying to figure out if I'm missing something. If I, I don't know, it's been this bizarre I think, thing. I think we're just old. Yeah. I mean, is it though? Like I enjoy other battle uh, royale games. Like why do I not like the leader? It just seems weird to me. Mm. Um and look, all these skins, I love all these characters. I love all this IP. Like it should suck me in. It just doesn't. I I just think the whole thing yeah. feels cheap to me, the way they're handling it. I don't know. I don't I don't think it feels cheap. Like I am actually pretty impressed by the quality of the of the licensed models they have. Like like I've like all the you know, I, I don't buy I haven't played obviously in years but when I I do watch the videos of the new you know, like all the Mandalorian stuff looks great like yeah. all the the Marvel stuff looks great all the you know Batman looks great the Alien looks great yeah, like, I'm never offended like, by it like I'm never yeah. like oh my gosh they, they've desecrated something that I really love like I never no, feel I mean, that it's way kind of, it's just sort of like I mean it's kind of like Smash Brothers I guess it's just like a, a, a bunch of nonsense happens in a competitive area and uh, it could be anyone from anything and it's just sort of fun. So, you know, I don't have any interest in playing it because I don't like the repetition of it. Like, that's the thing. That's the thing that multiplayer games have just uh, lost me on over the years is like, I don't want to do the same thing over and over again um, that often. And I know that's ridiculous coming from someone who plays so many Ubisoft open world games. But for some reason, the that repetition does not annoy me as much as the repetition of multiplayer deathmatch stuff, um, which is all I really get out of Battle Royale. Like, I know Battle Royale is not a deathmatch, but like, it doesn't feel much different to me. I mean, it is death uh, and playing match, is, except it's every Ripley man for himself. Gonna... It's not team-based. Yeah. And playing as Ripley doesn't really change my mind on that. You know, it's as cool as that is. Um, I am, I'll say this, Matt. I am kind of surprised that you do, that Fortnite doesn't resonate with you because all the stuff that they're doing, it, look, it's, again, that's why when I see this stuff, I'm like, are our friends behind this? Because... They are doing mm. stuff that should really appeal to you. Like right now, it's an alien like attacking, and then he's shot by like Ripley, and that like you know, and then here comes like the Terminators, and then it's like. Oh, yeah. But they're still in a multiplayer game. I don't care about. Yeah. yeah, like like I care about those characters when they pop up in Mortal Kombat because I like fighting games, but I don't care about this game. And, it, no matter who, well, no matter what skin I'm wearing, like it's not going to change the fact that I don't enjoy playing Fortnite. Okay. Yeah. Like you know, it's, I mean, I feel the same way. I, I don't care yeah. about frivolous stuff like cosmetics either. Like I don't buy cosmetics in any game, no matter how much I play it. I never buy cosmetics. Yeah, and also part of the appeal to me of like those kind of ca licensed characters in something like Mortal Kombat is that um, the they all play different. Yeah. You know, like yep. the Predator doesn't play like the Terminator, doesn't play like Robocop. Um, and it's interesting to me to see how they customize all those characters to feel like those characters. And Fortnite and in Fortnite particular, is, there's really no difference. Like, no, it's yeah. just you're just wearing a costume. Yeah. Um, the only difference between that and like the earlier costumes is that they got the license to put, you know, the real thing in the game. Right. It's like basically they've done sort of what we were talking about with the, the you know, selling your own secondary market stuff they're just doing it with mods yep you know true. in the past like these would be mods you'd use to put these characters in this game unofficially and now epic has just been like why don't we just license this shit since we're the biggest thing on the planet um and they you know not other games couldn't really do this like this is something that fortnite is just so big that it can like use that leverage to do this with it um the only more prolific licensor in pop culture is probably funko pop yeah um but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Epic poached a couple of licensed people from Funko for, to, to, for this initiative. I just wonder but, what happens uh, when they run out of stuff to license. Like, then what is Fortnite I do? don't think that will ever happen. Really? There will always be more to license. Really? I don't you're know. I mean, it seems culture. like it's a law of diminishing returns to me. Eventually, you're going to run out of stuff that people really care about. Sure, you're going to be able to license like, a will. character from some new sci-fi movie that people kind of liked, but... Like, you can you can go forever for the most part. Like they haven't even put the Ninja Turtles in this yet. They're just they're just starting. Yeah, I don't know. I 
they they wouldn't run out for another 20 years. Really? So, you uh, think that yeah. long? Yeah, there's a lot of pop culture out there. I just wonder, like, a Star Wars stuff, like, will that ever happen? Probably not. Like, they already But did. I didn't think, like, some of the other stuff the would happen either. So. The Star Wars is in this. Oh, it is? Dude, Fortnite is canon to Star Wars. The Emperor's announcement that he's come back to life in Rise of Skywalker happened in Fortnite. Like the, really? the opening, the opening. You never hear that announcement in the movie. The Rise of Skywalker's opening crawl is one reason that Rise of Skywalker is garbage. Rise of Skywalker's <laughs> opening crawl references the Fortnite speech from the Emperor. It says the I dead had no speak. Idea. That is referring to the Fortnite speech. The only place you can hear the Emperor's announcement to the universe that he's back is in Fortnite. Okay, so that's one less yeah. big IP that they've already used. Like I, I'm, well, then they point, only use it again. That like, kind of makes end, my point, though, is that I'm like, because there what's are left endless, to get in there? Well, there Star Wars. Star oh, it is Wars. in there already. No, there are endless <laughs> Star Wars characters. Star Wars has milked itself for 45 years. <laughs> uh, they're not running. They could just go on Star Wars and be a Star Wars game and be fine. But you've also got Marvel, which has all these 60 some years of content. You've got DC, which has 100 years of characters. You've but got my point is like everything you're, goes you're on. I mean, you like could do vampire characters that people you could do don't Buffy care the Vampire about. Slayer, and I'm just doing horror now. You could do yeah, all but that I don't, stuff. But people don't care about that stuff very much. That's my point. Someone those are very does. niche, like small groups of people care about that stuff. Like I'm I talking would about say stuff same, that actually same, the mass would, audience cares about. I would say it's as mass an audience as like Alien Buffy? or Terminator. Yeah. No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. In terms of sales, I bet you wouldn't see a whole lot of difference. Really? Yeah. It's not on the level of like Star Wars or Marvel or DC. Well, definitely but, not. But I you don't could, know, yeah, man. like that. I wouldn't. I don't think that's all that. Yeah, Has or there ever Robocop been a Buffy movie? Yeah, Buffy was a movie first. Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. Remember either. that? Started as a movie. It's not a very good, very good movie. It came out in like ninety two. Huh. Um, I thought yeah. that was always a TV show. Interesting. No, it was originally a movie that Whedon wrote, and it got turned into a movie that got rewritten heavily, and he didn't like it very much. And then when they, he got a chance to turn it into a TV series, he did that. Hmm. Uh, the TV series actually references the events of the movie a couple of times. Hmm. It is canon to the t- TV series. I don't know. I'm to me, I feel like eventually they're going to start running out of stuff that I give a crap about, and I'm not as big a pop culture maven as you are. Um, obviously. Well, you don't even play it, so I don't know what. Why do Why do they care about that? Well, I'm just saying, if you're trying to get people into the game via these pop culture icons, you're going to run out of icons eventually, mm-hmm. and then what? I don't think anything? they're trying to get people into the game anymore. I think they're just trying to get people that are already playing the game to, to spend money. Not quit. <laughs> and <laughs> that is, and money. that seems to be working just fine. Yep, absolutely. Yep, there are definitely no shortage of cash. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, let's move on. We're going to talk next about something that just happened this morning today. Um, big news. And this was what I was alluding to earlier when we were set, when I said that Sony may be trying to answer uh, some of the stuff that's been happening with Bethesda over at Xbox. And that was today. Uh, it was announced that Jade Raymond, who literally just left Stadia like a week ago, although now I think it, it's pretty obvious she left a while ago. Um, it was just announced that she left Stadia not long ago. Uh, she already has a new gig, and if you watched Pactor Factor from a few days or ago... She, she didn't leave a lot while ago, but she saw the handwriting on the wall and was already talking to people. Because this this didn't happen overnight, Matt. No. <laughs> like, she has a new studio called Haven, and it is already being backed by Sony. Look, there's I don't think there's any way you could work that in inside with Stadia stuff and not know that you were on a sinking <laughs> yeah, ship a like, long time ago. Like when, they anna- like when she went on stage and they announced Stadia, my guess is by then she was probably already like, I don't know if this is yeah, going to so work out or these not. These guys will pay me for the next nine, <laughs> ten months. I've got a contract here and I'm really happy. Somewhere. Like, yeah. yeah, like <laughs> I've done that, but I've taken the job I knew wasn't going to last, but I, they were paying me pretty well for that period of time. I was yeah. like, this will do for now. Like, I'll until ride the, it out. I'll make my money. Yeah, until I, I hit can. the iceberg, it'll be okay. You know? <laughs> and the big news is it's backed by Sony. Uh, Sony yeah. has invested in the studio, and the first game coming from the studio will, in fact, be a PlayStation exclusive. Uh, Pactor said that she already had another job. Well, I recorded mm-hmm. it like two weeks ago, but you just saw it on Pactor Factor a few days ago. So inside the industry, it's already been known that she had another job for quite a while um, and Pactor tipped you off to that in mm-hmm. Pactor Factor if you watched it whenever we put it up. Um, Matt, how it do you feel like about this? I feel good because this game will probably come out. <laughs> will and it? That, <laughs> I mean, unless Sony folds, like, uh, you know, if, if they can get Death Stranding out, they can get this out. I also like that she called the company Haven. <laughs> it's like, like safe fi- haven. Finally, we found somewhere safe to be. Um, 
From it's it's because uh, it's been a long time since she actually got to ship something. She hasn't shipped a game in over a decade, Matt. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, the really the last game that she can kind of put her name on, where she, it was her concept and like everything went through and it actually happened, is like Watch Dogs. Yeah, like she started the studio that developed Watch Dogs and kicked off that IP, and that really is her last sort of big shipped thing that she's done mm-hmm. in the industry. She went on to work at EA for a while, um, and worked she on- went on to EA Motive, and their thing, their first thing didn't materialize, and their Star Wars thing didn't materialize. And- yep, and then she left there, and then she went to Stadia and worked there for a couple years, and we all know the story with that. They just completely dropped all their original games, all their original IP. Uh, they're not going to create games anymore. And here she goes to launch her own thing, which is the one thing that she has not done yet, which is start her own studio, her own independent mm-hmm. studio. And it's interesting because she, in the press releases and everything, it's independent, indie, independent. And I think that maybe set expectations for some people that maybe her ga- the games that come out of the studio are going to be these smaller projects um, that may be like your typical indie game, a side-scrolling platformer or a first-person horror adventure or whatever the typical stereotypes are for indie games. Do you think that's going to be the case, Matt? No. Me either. Like, I think these are big-budget AAA projects that she's going to work yeah. on. Um, I, in mean, the indep- of I think independent of this just means we aren't answering to anybody. Right. We own survival. it independently. Nobody owns us, which yeah. may also change in the not too distant future. I would imagine yeah, you can be an independent studio and still not make indie games because the indie game thing. I mean, if we're really talking about what the words mean, it means you are independently funded. If you are being funded by Sony, you are not making an indie game, but you can still be an independent studio. Gearbox did that forever. Like Gearbox. You know, obviously wasn't making indie games or making Borderlands for 2K, but Gearbox was an independent studio. No one could tell them what to do except Randy Pitchford. And most importantly with Jade is she has extensive experience in launching new IP. She launched yeah. Assassin's Creed. She launched Watch Dogs. She had a couple different IP that she was working on at other places that never saw the light of day. But nevertheless, she got into a studio that you know started from the ground up with nothing and started building a team and then started building a project She's a perfect person to do something like this. Um, do you think that Sony jumped in on this because of what happened with Bethesda, Matt? Mm, probably not directly. Um, do you think the seems... timing of the announcement might be tied into it in some way? Because this seems a little rushed. Like Maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't think this is a counter to Bethesda in any real way. Um, but I do think she has this sensibility that makes her a fit to Sony. Um, you know, like the idea of like, you know, a creative person who can bring stuff from nothing to something, um, that isn't afraid to kind of break a paradigm here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she, you know, I'm not saying she's in the same vein as Kojima necessarily, but like, she's much more like Kojima than she is like a corporate Microsoft entity. You know what I mean? Like she, I mean, one of the reasons people are speculating about the indie thing versus the independent thing is because you could see her make stuff like that mm-hmm. if she if she wanted to. Like you don't really know what she's going to do next in a lot of ways. That's one of the reasons I wish we'd gotten more games from her in the last ten years because I like uh, the stuff she comes up with. Like even if it's sometimes rough when it comes out, um, I love the first Assassin's Creed, but certainly no one's going to claim that's a perfect game. No. Um, but like, wow, you can see so much potential and, and, and heart behind it. Um, and, uh, I don't know if I'd say the same. I think you Dogs, Death didn't... Stranding as well, though. Like, it's like, yeah, I mean, Death Stranding is a, is a labor of love. Uh, like no, no one, that game doesn't exist if you don't believe in that concept, uh, right. for better or worse. Um, Do you think that might be what's been happening to Jade though? At these stops that she's been at over the last 10 years is that maybe the projects just or something like Death Stranding, where I'm be, I'll be honest with you, like I could see that Death Stranding was not going to be a huge financial success uh, mm-hmm. before I played it. Um, you think maybe, and look, Sony's willing to take those risks, obviously. It put a lot of money into Kojima Studio to, to release Death Stranding. But do you think that that might be why she hasn't resurfaced and has taken so long? No, I think she's been screwed over by student executive shit okay. um because look all the, like while for for all the 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 elements of like weirdness and paradigm breaking she may do uh her two biggest examples of that 
are Assassin's Creed and Watch Dogs, two gigantic mega hits, one of which has defined Ubisoft's output for the last 17 years almost. Yeah. So um, I don't think she has a track record that can allow you to say, I don't know if your ideas are going to work at market. Like she's proven that that works. I think she's just ended up in bad luck situations where the the over our overarching situation was being mismanaged by higher ups, um, which is hardly an unusual situation to find yourself in an EA. Um, the Stadia thing, I don't know. I mean, who knows what they told her up front or convinced her of up front? Um, clearly, she knew what was going on and had this you know this uh, uh, this lifeboat ready to go by the time Stadia collapsed like a flan in a cupboard. Um, so clearly she and probably everybody else who was working internally at Google for that, uh, knew what was going on long before we did. I mean, actually, I guess we knew as well when it came down to like, we knew, we, I mean, come on, we knew, um, but, uh, Everyone knew except Super Bomber Man. Um, (laughs) so yeah, I, 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 I am hesitant. I mean, it could be that her projects were too esoteric for mainline executives to green light in the end. But I really am inclined to give her the benefit of the doubt on this and say that she was making stuff that was her usual sort of, you know, good idea with solid mechanics and solid, you know, a little bit of paradigm breaking here and there, but something that is clearly marketable. And just she was coming. I mean, the Star Wars thing was was just nobody's fault on the ground. That, that was EA on a macro level beyond anything you could imagine. The Stadia is the same way. The only thing I could I could really say, like, maybe that first motive game that we never saw materialize. Maybe that was something a little too esoteric or whatever, but I don't know if that, I don't know. There's no evidence to support that. Willing to take risks than Mm -hmm. a lot of other publishers are. Who is Ubisoft? Yeah. I mean, they have a roller skating game coming out. So (laughs) I forgot about that. Yeah. (laughs) Roller champions. It's like a roller derby game. Like Ubisoft is willing to kind of, Strike out in the dark and, and oh, yeah. kind of see what what happens. I mean, say what you will about the crew games, but that is a bizarre way to go. It is bizarre. Let I, alone make two of them. Yeah, like, I mean, Ubi's known for that. Like, just think about his press conferences. Like, oh yeah, the goofy stuff that it does in his press conferences. Why, like, why does Steep exist? Right, that's what I'm because, saying. Like, and like, so I don't. To me, I wonder if and they're if, still supporting that I game. I know. I, to me, I wonder if Ubi and Jade were the perfect match. And I think they I think in terms of kind of tone they were, but I, I and I wonder if maybe it would be a better fit now that some of the people higher up at UB who were a, a problem yeah. in terms of you know blocking women Not rising through the ranks her, and, honesty, and harassing and stuff. I mean yeah. yeah, like that would be uh you know, maybe but again, like that would be a backwards move for her right now. Oh, Sony yeah. is also very supportive of weird stuff yeah, and, and esoteric sure. creators. So right. you know, and that's I mean, why is, I think she's found another perfect right. match. Yeah. And I'm saying even though if it takes a while, this is the this is the company that let Team Eco take eleven years to make right. the last guardian. Like yeah. we're gonna see something out of Jade here. Yeah. We're gonna get we're gonna get the game. Um, yeah. Who knows how long it's gonna take? <laughs> mm-hmm. It may be a while, man. It, maybe, but at the same time, like they got Kojima's game out in two years. They did. And maybe in this situation, you know, maybe all she needs is to be left alone and given enough resources to build. Yeah, give the give her the big resources. Enough team with talented say, people. Go and, for it. Like, because I have to imagine that EA is a micromanaging place to be i like would definitely say that's probably true so i think in a i think a situation where they basically said where she presents what we want to do and sony's like cool let's do that go for it let us know when you got something to show us and she goes off with her team and they make the thing like that sounds like the ideal situation for jade raven to me the other thing too to me anyway is that look she hasn't shipped anything for 10 years games have changed in the last decade not probably not as much as they should have to be fair but they have um, and you know, there's always that concern. Someone's been out of the game for that long. Are they capable the of, well, that's the thing though. She hasn't been out of the game. She's been working constantly. We just yeah. haven't seen what she made. I it's just... not like she stopped learning. It's not like she stopped yeah. paying attention to the, to the medium. It's just, we never got to play what she made in that time. Yeah, that's true. Um, and look, I'm a big fan of Jade and I have faith that she's going to create something that I personally am probably going to really love and geek out over. Um, Mm -hmm. whether it will be financially successful and whether everyone else will agree with me, who knows? Um, but you know, I'm sure once upon a time, someone would have brought up the idea of Assassin's Creed to someone and they'd been like, who would, who cares about that? Who cares about like ancient assassins, like 
jumping off of a tree and stabbing someone through the neck with a blade. Well, also, you forget how much of that game they had to invent. Right. Like the tech, like they had to invent the tech to make their idea for that game happen. Like yep. there was nothing that existed that could make Assassin's Creed work. They had to, they had to build it. Um, and they did, you know, it took a couple of games to, to refine it yep. into what, into what it needed to be. But uh, that, you, you know, that first game is rough, but like you still, I, I it's played still what the first they Assassin's sold Creed me. five, time, five I mean, times, five times. It's, it's exactly what, what it said. Yeah. What they said it was going to be like, yeah. I wasn't, when I played it, I wasn't like, Hey, what is this? Like, and it's funny that like it was, you know, I gave it a five out of five when it came out. I loved it. I still love it. I played it five times um, yeah. over the years. And there's still nowadays it's funny to me that there are people that go back to that first game now and are like, oh, the new the new games are too action RPG and they should be more like the first Assassin's Creed because that really felt like assassinating someone. Yeah. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, they did the, the games did kind of lose her vision. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah. her vision yeah. wasn't for Assassin's Creed to be what it is now. <laughs> oh no, no. She left, and that's when the game started changing to what they are now. Yeah, there was a methodical element to that first first two games in terms of kind of planning the assassinations, gathering information, and learning about how. Because that's the, and like the first game doesn't hold your hand on that nearly as much as the later ones do. Where if you if you actually do pay attention during the, all the eavesdropping missions and stuff, you will learn different ways into the place you need to assassinate someone that will not be highlighted by the HUD. That will not be remind you won't be reminded of it necessarily. But someone will say something during the eavesdrop mission about like we're stacking these boxes up behind this building. And you go over there, and there they are, stacked back there, and you can get in through the back window. And it's a much easier way to assassinate the guy instead of just going through the front or kind of climbing through the rafters or something. Yep. Um, it's all there. It's you know, and that's an interesting idea that I would kind of like to see them re-explore again because yep. they really did get away from that uh, in subsequent games. Another feather in Sony's cap. Yeah, they got Jade Raymond making exclusive games for PlayStation, and they have yep. Kojima making exclusive games for PlayStation. Um, and now developers know, you know what, I'm not trapped here. Like, my game may eventually make it to PC as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think last week I talked about feathers in the cap a couple of times during the show. And here's another case where it's like people are sizing up the two platforms. They're like, hey, that girl that made Assassin's Creed is making games for PlayStation and just for PlayStation now. So um, just another thing for people to consider when they're going to buy the new consoles here over the next year and a half. I do think that we probably won't see her game for three years is my guess. Yeah, uh, about if she's right. just starting the team now. I mean, does she even have like a game spec'd out? Like, or did she use that already? I am, at, at Stadia? I'm sure like, she has other ideas. I'm yeah, sure she I'm, does, but like, you know, how far along was she on the project at Stadia? Does Stadia now own that? Like, can she bring people over from Stadia who were working on that game with her there? Like, well, I don't know. The the cloud tech of Stadia makes it impossible for anything <laughs> that ran on that to run. Yeah, I don't know. I, I you know, who knows? Yeah. We, what we know about Google, maybe they didn't even care. I mean, it may be a case where they're like, maybe even before she went there, she's like, look, this IP, if it doesn't work out here, I'm taking it with me. It may be in her contract that she could do that. And That would be nice. And look, Google, why would Google care about her taking the people? Because right. they're not making games anymore. So it could be a smoother transition than we yeah. think. Well, and also, why would Google care about the IP? Right, exactly. What's Google going to do with a game exactly. idea? And she could have negotiated her exit. Maybe she says to them, look, I'll let you out of my contract. You don't have to pay me for the next four years, which is what they're on the hook for. If you give me the IP and you let me take what we've done here over to work with on my new studio, and they didn't maybe didn't even know that Sony was investing in it yet or whatever, she's just like, I'm going to start my own independent studio. I'm sick of this shit, and I want to take my what people I want to take, and mm -hmm. I want to take this idea and the work that we've done over there. If you let me do that, I'll let you out of my contract. That very yeah. well could have happened. Or you let me do that. I won't talk about what happened right. here. Yeah, I mean, there's ways yeah. that she could have worked it. So maybe it isn't three years. Maybe it's... Because I'd read that tell-all book, too. I would, too. <laughs> she <laughs> has a great book to write someday, for sure. Yeah, she does. Absolutely. So anyway, Jade, best of luck. I really hope the best. And I think you're right. Like, we're going to see her output this time. Like, yes. unlike the last 10 years, we're going to eventually see what she's working on this time. Um, it is a little bit of a bummer that it's exclusive. You know, obviously people who bought a Series X already are like, dang, um, I wish I'd known that before I made my pulled the trigger on it or whatever. But that's the way the industry operates, and uh, you just got to roll with the punches sometimes. So, uh, And well, you got a few years to save up for the PS5. That's so, true. Yeah. If this is really your system seller. Yep, absolutely. So uh, best of luck to Jade and to uh, Haven, the brand new studio that she just formed. Mm -hmm. uh, let's move on. We're going to talk next. Man, it's hard to believe we got this many topics in this show. <laughs> it really is hard to believe. About 
what I'm calling the double zombie. That is what is in the uh, mm-hmm. in the lower third for this topic. Matt, can you think of any time where fans have revived a game that was killed by a publisher and done it legitimately, not like illegally or we're going to keep modding this thing that existed and it's not really like legit, but you're still going to be able to download the patches. Have you ever had fan? Can you think of another time where fans legitimately revived a game that had people had been playing for a long time? The publisher didn't care anymore, and the fans were like, "We can't let this go." And then the publisher actually worked with them to revive it. Can you think of any? No. Um, I mean, there have been MMOs that shut down and had fan servers that went up right. that, that, that had developers that kind of on the sly helped with some stuff. Mm-hmm. But in terms of an actual like relaunch, no, I can't think of one that ha- where that happened. Well, that is exactly what's happening with Epic's, again, a big Epic episode, with Epic's mm-hmm. MOBA Paragon. It's now, It's been renamed to Predecessor and a group of fans who loved Paragon, which I'm I guess they were out there, Matt. There's, there were some people that loved this MOBA. Um, they raised $2.2 million, I think it was via crowdfunding, uh, to help support them. And then this is bolstered by the fact that Epic gave up all the assets for the game for free, uh, which Epic values at over $12 million worth of assets. It just gave out to the world and was like, you know what? We're not going to use this stuff. Somebody else might. And, yeah, they're going to use it for this revived version called Predecessor. My, my first question to you, Matt, is, is this a good idea? Do you even remember Paragon at all? I mean, once I saw it on the rundown, I was like, oh, yeah, that. Uh, if you hadn't put it in the rundown, I don't, don't think I would have ever thought of it again. It was I guess a until 3D, this happened. Um, I was to call it Melee Heavy. Uh, yeah, I remember it was Melee Heavy. You played as, you play as gods in it, I think. Yep. Like you pick different gods and yeah, I, I think I played it a couple of times just to see what it was. Like it's probably the 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 closest analog I would say as far as popular MOBAs are concerned is Smite. Um because it is a 3D Okay, maybe I'm thinking of Smite. Smite is all gods, you're right. Yeah. But these were like fiction those like Smite tries to use like real Greek mythology in a very loose way. These were like sci-fi gods, so to speak. In, okay. In I don't Paragon. think I played Paragon then. Um, it's, it's probably the best-looking 3D MOBA on the market, to be honest with you. Um, it looks mm. way better than Smite. It's like realistic-looking instead of cartoony. Um, and I played it a few times. I could never really get into it. Honestly, I like the traditional MOBA, like League of Legends or uh, Heroes of the Storm, like the more isometric or Dota. The isometric kind of can see more of the map at once type MOBA. This is one of those where the camera's right over the shoulder of your character. Uh, it's really melee heavy. Uh, there is there is range stuff in it, but for the most part, it's all melee based. And it just never really found an audience. I remember Hoffman, when he first went there, tried to get me to play. He's like, oh, I know you like League. He's like, you should give our new MOBA a go. And that's why I played it. And I could just never resonate with it. I think what I, I like, what bothers me the most about MOBAs that are like this, where it's like 3D over the shoulder camera is fighting the waves of the creeps. Like there's just something weird about just having these repetitive enemies fighting them in 3D versus fighting them in kind of an isometric camera angle where you can see the waves coming. Um, In this game, it just felt like a repetitive hack and slash to me after a while. There wasn't Mm -hmm. a ton of depth in the combat. And so I was like, I felt like I was just playing Dynasty Warriors. Every once in a while, I'd come across another main character to fight. I always like. I always remember a, a game. It wasn't a MOBA because it predates MOBAs, but it was called. I think it was called Savage. Hmm. It probably wouldn't be called that today. Um, but, <laughs> probably uh, not. It was basically a real-time strategy game uh, where people you could play as the individual units, and one player was like the general, like the leader. Mm -hmm. And so the, the general leader on the team could see the whole map, like a normal real time strategy game. And the rest of you were all on the ground as individual units. And the general guy could click on places and instruct you what to do. And you didn't have to do it if you didn't want to. But the idea was that you had someone sort of macro strategy watching the whole battlefield and sort of giving you guidance on what needed to happen on the ground because you weren't able to see Didn't that perspective. Didn't Ubisoft have a game like that too not that long ago? Maybe? Yeah. What was it I don't, called? I don't know. I can't remember. But I think Ubisoft had one like that too where it was an RTS but you had one person who was like the mastermind. Oh, um, 
There was a, um, yeah. I remember the like, trailer for it. It had like it was a, a live action trailer. Yeah, it had I think a it was dude a Tom at this Clancy like sci fi looking like board. Like I can't. Someone in chat may remember what it was. Yeah, there was. Uh, I want. Uh, there was also like um, Need for Speed did that at one point. You remember <laughs> really? that? Like yeah, one of the Need for Speed games had or the open world Need for Mag. Speed games had that was Mag, Ubisoft That's game, right. Yeah. It had a Need for Speed game that was like it had, loves a, Joe. Uh, Thank it had you. an app and you oh, you booted up the app. And the auto, the auto, what was it? Remember that? Remember that? What was the, the login thing you had to do? Auto drive or auto, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, auto yeah. log. Auto log. That's yeah. it. And you'd logged into the, the app and you, and the player on the app got like a big map of the whole open world map and you could see all the players in the session and you could fuck with people. Like you could like, start races or you could like send cops after individual players i forgot or, like, send about helicopters that. after them <laughs> they did the same that. i think they did the same thing with um battlefield uh, the battlefield had that too like, yeah it has you, commander you had, view absolutely commander view yeah. yeah they still have that in battlefield and it annoys hmm. the crap out of me because <laughs> you have some dude who's like trying to tell you what to do and i'm like no i'm not doing that and then like he has like this thing where he can like mess with you he's like dude do what i'm telling you to do basically like this ping and i'm like just stop like i'm trying to kill people like i hated it in battlefield and here we see how why savage did not catch on <laughs> well, i the think the concept can work as i recall is the problem with savage is also that they it was literally an rts to the degree that like you had to walk up to a tree and hit it a bunch of times to give the team wood, right? <laughs> like, you, I mean, you, they, they didn't just have you running around doing MOBA stuff. You had to do, like, the RTS gather, gather resource shit, uh-huh. which is incredibly boring. It is. Um, so yeah. that was a bad idea. But um, I think the idea could work, but that's not what... I mean, there's something there. There is absolutely something there. But that's not what Paragon is. Paragon no. is literally, it's a MOBA where you play as your one character, and it's being revived. Yeah. It never really had a huge audience. And so my question is... But apparently it had a dedicated one. Yes. I mean, apparently there's a small group of people who cared a whole lot about it when it went away, um, enough to raise $2.2 million and then use the free assets that Epic gave up to create Predecessor, and that's what we're seeing now. This is actually mm-hmm. Predecessor. The B-roll before was from the OG Paragon. Um, Matt, do you think this is a good idea? Do you think these people just wasted their money? Probably. Yeah. Um, then again, it's not like Epic can't afford to throw somebody a bone once in a while. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's cool as crap that Epic did this. That it just said, here, take all the assets and go at it. But the people mm-hmm. who have spent the $2.2 million, like, do you think they're going to get a return on their investment beyond, like, yeah, this we can play this now. <laughs> like, probably, probably not. Yeah, uh, I sure wish someone would do that with City of Heroes. Oh yeah, um, that's actually a really good idea. That, I'd love to play that game again. That actually, if it were revived, might have a future. Because when yeah, I look at Paragon, so. it's like the people who gave who who donated the two point two million. They're probably the only people who are going to play this. Like I, just because fans revive something, that doesn't spark my interest in it. It doesn't make me interested in it again. We are talking about it on Game Face, so maybe we're helping give it a second chance. But my guess is most people watching this aren't going to go immediately download Predecessor and give it a go either because they didn't like Paragon, but now because fans gave $2.2 million, they do. Like, it just it just seems like a waste of money and a big waste of time for the people who are involved in the project. But I think you're right. I think maybe the better discussion is what other games maybe we should do this with that actually in the ga- a game that would have a chance to actually ha- be revived and have fans get involved with it. Um, like tribes, maybe like the OG mm. tribes for me, like I, that game to me does have some relevance. Now there still re- really aren't any shooters that play like that. And my argument against the recent tribes is that they became way too complicated. You got to keep it simple, stupid. And the tribes, like the times that they've done like tribes two or tribes three tribes, ascension, like the, even as a tribes fan, I felt overwhelmed by those games. I was like, there's too much in here. Like, where's the base? Now there's like 20 bases. Like, no, <laughs> there, there should be two freaking bases. My base and the other team's base. I go and take the other team. Everyone understands that. It just became way too complicated. So the way I look at this whole story is that maybe people like me or whoever, or people who really like City of Heroes, should feel inspired by it to do something about it. Now, do I think... I could get the tribe's IP from high res to do something like this. Probably not. Like, I don't think they're going to be nice like Epic and be like, because high res is also kind of in dire straits right now. 
Um, but I don't see them being like epic and being gracious and just saying, here's all the assets. Just go do what you want. You can use the IP if you want. Although they did change the name of the game for this project. And, you know, it's not called Paragon anymore. Um, but what do you think it's about City of Heroes? Do you think that's feasible with something like City of Heroes? Uh, probably not. I don't know what happened to City of Heroes. I know, I, City of Heroes also has never had a fan server or any kind of resurrection in that regard because no one could ever get hold of the source code. Who owns it? Is it Funcom? Um, I guess. Does Funcom still exists? I don't know. Yeah, it does. Yeah, they do all the Conan stuff still. Um, NCSoft, NCSoft, I guess, still has it. I mean, they still um, exist. I'm surprised um, with I, all the Avengers stuff. Okay, I guess, I guess, okay, April 2019, Source Code Cable Running City Hero Server was distributed and made it possible to create them outside the direct purview and revived interest to in the game. Huh. Uh, as of August 2020, NCSoft has not moved to have servers based on the short Source Code shut down. Wow. So I know what I'm doing after this show's over. <laughs> Are you really going to do it? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to look into it, yeah. Huh. I love City Heroes. I mean, a lot of people did. A lot of people at G4 love City of Heroes, and a lot of people who worked at Game Trailers love City of Heroes. They would go home yeah. and play after work. I had my, uh, I had my City of, I mean, I like City of Villains a little bit more. Um, I had, uh, I had my my commander, my commander class with uh, all my ninjas. Um, I enjoyed that a lot. I'll say uh, this: that is one MMO I stuck with longer than almost any of the other ones that I tried. I did, I did actually, I did actually stop playing City of it. it kind of mostly permanently in 2004 because I was playing it uh, one night, the night uh, I was playing it when my cat died, oh. basically. Like literally like suddenly realized he wasn't there and went in the bathroom and he was dying under the sink. And I've, I've always been like- The association. If I, if I had not been playing City of Heroes, would I have been paying attention to what happened to him kind of thing? Yeah, but um, you probably wouldn't have stopped the inevitable from happening though. Probably not, no. But uh, it's cats just one also, of those when they I, pass away, they want nothing to do with you. They go hide somewhere and they're like, leave yeah. me alone. That was the hardest well, he, part of my cat dying, when she wanted nothing to do with me while she was dying. I was like, no, I, yeah. need, I need closure. And she's like, get away. <laughs> well, yeah, we, I mean, she she was very sick. Or he was very sick at the time. Yeah. Uh, anyway, he had been in and out of the hospital, but like just thought he was okay and he wasn't. Yeah. And I was playing City Heroes at the time. So uh, maybe that's why I don't like that. MMOs very much. But um, I think this is a fool's errand, this project. But I think, I think that the idea is a sound one. If you can find, like, City of Heroes is a great example. It's a shame because City of Heroes missed the whole superhero wave. Like, Yeah, there would have been. And also, City of Heroes, I don't think their character creation has ever been equaled. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, it was incredible. That's a big reason why I stuck with it, honestly. You know, you know the other game I would like, the other stupid MMO that nobody nobody liked that I would like to play again? Uh, Earth and Beyond. I don't even remember that one. Remember that? No. That was in, that was EA. That was by EA, like around 2001, 2002-ish. And it was an MMO where you were a spaceship. Um, and uh, it, was by the, it was by the team that made Command & Conquer Renegade. Uh, speaking of RTSs being turned into other things, yeah. uh, it was actually used the same engine as Renegade. Uh, and you just flew or you picked like an explorer ship or a combat ship or like a healing ship. And you basically flew around the galaxy from solar system to solar system, and, and like you either fought stuff or you explored. And I, I was an explorer, and I, I, I would stay. I was at before you came to Tech TV, and I would stay after work every night and play it on the on the PC in the game lab. And eventually, I went to every star system, <laughs> and I was done. Like that, I maxed the I maxed out the level. I saw everything in the game, and I was like, I guess. I guess the That's game's <laughs> over, and that was it. There's nothing else to do, and then they shut the game down like six months later. But uh, I would love to play that game again. It was it was uh, it was fun. Yeah, I wonder if anyone in chat has brought up any games that they're like if this could actually work for that they'd be excited about. It's really hard to think of too many because even like things that you think are dead IP, somebody owns it. It's Tabula like, Rasa. Ah, wow, that's a I good one actually, one. and that might be available actually. Yeah, that was uh, that was Lord British, right? Yeah, and f I think that was Funcom actually. That sounds right. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big failure. I don't know if people liked it enough though to want to revive. I it. remember I bought the collector's edition of that uh, on the way to a party because it was the night it came out. And you were I the never life of the party. I no, I left <laughs> it in the car, but I never opened it. Like when I moved, I found it in a box, still sealed and shrink wrapped. And I looked on eBay, and it was worth like four bu four bucks. <laughs> no one cared about Tabula Rasa. Erebus Jones says Marvel Heroes. 
Oh, Marvel Heroes would be a huge one. Definitely yeah. not going to get that one, though. That's not no, gonna that, I mean, Marvel Heroes, shutting Marvel Heroes down was a crime. Yeah. Like, that game was great. Uh, you're not going to be Diablo. able to revive that one. No, that was by the Diablo 2 guys. <laughs> you're not going to get the assets um, for that one. I spent a ridiculous amount of money on that game. Getting yeah, costumes and alone. characters and stuff. Yeah, I had friends back uh, home that were really And that thing just shut down like that. Gazillion got screwed on that. It's weird how that um, happened. Yeah. And for a long time, I know for a long time, the Marvel hated uh, hated that game because uh, Gazillion's license let them use anyone. Um, and at the time, Marvel was trying to downplay the Fantastic Four and the X-Men because Fox had the movie license. Right. But Gazillion was like, we don't give a <laughs> shit about that. We're doing more Fantastic Four. And at one point, they actually did manage to pull the Fantastic Four from the game. Really? From the market. You couldn't buy the Fantastic Four characters anymore after a certain point. But then they shut the whole game down like three months later uh, uh, and started over. And now we got the Avengers. Yeah. Um, I would love to play Marvel Heroes again. That was a great game. Not going to happen, was, though. You're definitely not going to get the assets too. for like, that. that was like, <laughs> they shut that thing down like three months after it finally launched on consoles, too. Like, yeah, that's um, so bizarre. Mar- like, who does it that was, to a Marvel game? It's so it's weird. Very weird. It was a very weird corporate choice. Yeah. No other explanation. Yep. Well, anyway, look, if you want to play an odd MOBA, and I know you all are huge MOBA players, <laughs> um, and you want to support a, good a odd group, MOBA I mean, now look, I, I give these guys props. Like, it, it's awesome what they've done and they're trying to do. Yeah. And I don't want to be like sour grapes on the whole project. I don't think it's going to be successful ultimately, uh, but I do think it could inspire other projects that could be. So kudos to these guys. Uh, again, it's a completely reworked version of Paragon called Predecessor. And it's time to move on to our last topic of this week's episode, and that is Star Citizen. And this week, Matt, Star Citizen, this is insane, crossed 300 and $50 million worth of crowdfunding. It's been eight years of crowdfunding since they launched the whole program. The game was originally supposed to be released in November of 2014. <laughs> Matt, is this is what I want to ask you, because I know that you are invested in this game. You are one of the people who has bought ships and it put mm-hmm. a big chunk of cash. You have skin in this game. Matt, is Star Citizen <laughs> a scam? No, I don't think it's a scam. Um, I do think it is a bait and switch okay. to some degree. Because um, here's the thing. I did back it on Kickstarter, and I did buy some lifetime uh, insurance ships I haven't bought a ship on that thing since like November 2013 when they stopped giving away lifetime insurance automatically with every ship purchase. Um, but I do have about seven. Now, what does that mean, Matt? For people who uh, don't lifetime know. insurance, basically the what, the way the game is going to work, theoretically going to work one day, maybe someday when we're all seventy, is um, in the in the multi uh, the MMO version of it. They, you know, because Star Citizen is different from Squadron 42, which is the single player cinematic Wing Commander uh, spiritual successor. Uh, Star Citizen is the name for the uh, multiplayer game with the living universe. The, the you know the the um, the uh, um, Matt. Why are they uh, making two games? Uh, well, that's kind of part of the. I'll get to that. That's kind okay. of part of the bait and switch. Um, the uh, lifetime insurance basically means like if your ship gets blown up in the multiplayer game and it's not insured, you lose it. For good. Like you, you for good. You have to buy another ship. If you have insurance on it, which you can pay either with real money supposedly or with in-game money, uh, your ship will be replaced with the insurance policy. Early, early on, like it, it, I believe it ended. It ended around Thanksgiving 2013. If you bought a ship through the pledge manager thing, you got lifetime insurance with that ship, which means that forever. Every time that ship of yours gets blown up, another one will instantly respawn for free in your hangar. Um, Not any add-ons or bonus stuff or cargo or whatever, but the ship itself will pop back up in your hangar. Uh, Lifetime insurance versions of ships go for a lot of money, or did for a while. I don't know know how hot the secondary market is these days. I haven't looked in a while. The bait and switch I'm talking about is that the initial pitch 
was much more focused on Squadron 42, which is the spiritual successor to Wing Commander. I just wanted to play another fucking Wing Commander game. And that the is Star why you Citizen... got in on the Kickstarter? Yeah, the Star okay. Citizen element was like a multiplayer focused persistent universe thing that was supposed to be like an add-on expanded kind of how we'll make the game last sort of forever thing. Uh, Squadron 42 is what, you know, when you're th when I'm thinking about the game that was supposed to be out in 2014, I'm thinking about Squadron 42, which they already shot all the footage with Malcolm McDowell and, and Mark Hamill and all these other actors for the live action, you know, motion capture cutscenes and stuff like Wing Commander 3 and Wing Commander 4. Um, and they're, you know, they've got, they've supposedly had roadmaps out for this, the Squadron 42 stuff that's separate from the Star Citizen stuff. Uh, Squadron 42 is supposed to hit like early alpha at like the end of 2019. It still hasn't hit early alpha now. Um, it's never happening. Like, it's just, it, you're at a point where you're like, okay, it's been nine years. Like, you know, where is this thing? Um, I don't it even seems care like a about lot of money Citizen. to invest in something to not come through. Uh, but it's not their we, money, so... Right. <laughs> um, I mean, it seems to be, you know, there's a lot of uh, questions about, like, you know, clearly there's, it's the victim of some feature creep. No one, no one's there to tell Chris Roberts no about any new idea. Um, they basically just keep adding things and adding things and adding things, and it's just never going to get done. Meanwhile, um, Elite Dangerous is kind of catching up to their ideas with an actual game. Like Elite Dangerous is about to launch us an expansion that adds ground combat and like all this stuff that like Star Citizen has promised forever but just hasn't been able to deliver. Um, there is a playable alpha server on the thing. You know, not I mean alpha is a generous term for what exists of Star Citizen right now. Um, you can go in and you can kind of fly a ship around and go to a, a planet that one planet and like there's a there's a like a star based city kind of place you can walk around in. Um, it's very buggy and unstable and, and no persistent anything really, unless you like force it to be. Um, you can fly some of the ships, not all the ships. A lot of the ships they sell these days are just pictures, you know, that'll one day be in the game. Um, like they're not even modeled yet? You can't even like look at them in no. 3D? Oh no, wow. no, no, no. Like they're just like one day they'll be there, trust wow. us. Give us, give us $800. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I I have gotten my entertainment's worth out of this game. Really? Even though it doesn't exist, because the cult surrounding it is so <laughs> I mean, laughing at the people watch. that are involved. Um, I mean, there, there was literally a thread last week or the week before on the forums that was, um, you know, are you okay with a 20-year development cycle for this game? Like, if, if, if this game comes out, like, then, like, in 20 years, are you okay with that? And a couple of these people are like, I'm gonna be 70 when that happens. And, I'm, and a couple of them were fine with it. Um, like they're like, I guess this is what I'll do when I'm retired. Wow. When this game comes out, and I'm just like, I, I can't even imagine. And like, when I talk, you know, and the, then the inter other, cause the other interesting thing about Star Citizen is most of the people who are hard into this thing are older. Like you and I are like low, like young end of the really? spectrum for Star Citizen investors, let's call them Which that. Which seems crazy because they're the ones who should be really worried about whether it ever is going to come out or Right, not. but that's exactly it. A lot of these people are in their 50s. They're the ones who grew up in the hardcore flight sim, space sim era uh -huh. and have had nothing comparable to it, and they have a lot of disposable income now. Oh. And that's what they're throwing at this thing, and it's amazing. Like, it's... Some of it's sad. Some of it's almost aspirational. Um, the, the long and the short of it is, I, do I think this is a scam? No, I do not think it's a scam. I do not think that Chris Roberts planned to steal money from everyone and never make a game in exchange. I do think that something has gone horribly wrong with the management of this project. And unless someone steps in and fixes it, it will never come out. Do you think and that he's realized? I don't though, think anyone he can, though, because he's in charge of all of it. No one can do anything about this. Do you think that he's realized at this point, though, that he doesn't need to finish the game because these whales, as you're talking <laughs> about, are just going to keep feeding the coffers? I think that is a fair assessment at this point. Uh, also, like people go on about how, oh my God, they, they've raised $350 million, what a ridiculous amount of money. Like they must just be all riding yachts to Aruba and stuff. But if you crunch the numbers, that's about how much it would cost to keep these dev studios the size they have open this long. Why can't like they finish the game though, Matt? I mean, it's because been nine they keep years. There, there's been people that come out of it. It's like, you know, they work there briefly. It's like everything. There's no communication. 
they change what what things should be and now you have to redo everything they're trying to build things you know they're trying to build the physics system before they build a flight system and then the flight system doesn't work because the physics system wasn't built to handle it so they got to redo that like they've started over a couple times they switched uh engines from crytek to cryengine to lumberyard and now they might be switching over to something else the last i heard like it's just a disaster of project management from top to bottom. And there's there's no way to pull it all together, really. Um, it's astounding. And like Scott, I mean, look, at, at a certain point, the Star Citizen thing had clearly, the, the, the Star Citizen as the multiplayer aspect of this had clearly spun off into crazy town. And for a while I was like, well, I'm, I, I just want to get Squadron 42. I just want the single player campaign game, which is really what I like about Wing Commander anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll be happy with that. But then it just, you know, I said that like circa 2015, <laughs> you know, like huh. I said that around the time I started hosting this show with you. Wow. To, to, Think as, about as that. I, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. And at this point, look, it's sunk costs. Like my, I spent that money. You spent in the money so long ago. It's like, you don't even. Yeah, it's, it's like it's just whatever. gone. Um, so what are you going to do? You know, so at this point, I'm just sort of sitting back and watching and seeing what happens. Like, what do you think? Uh, gonna, you think if people stop contributing, they'll finish the game? Or do you think that would just end the game? I think that would just end the game. They're, they, you can't finish this thing. That's the thing. It's like it's un, it's unfinishable. What they've proposed to do is unfinishable. How like, old is the lead developer? Chris Roberts? Yeah. He's got to be his late fifties by now, I think. Wow. So, Matt, would you recommend anyone invest in this game at this no! point? No, no. The only thing I would recommend is like, if you if you can get like if they sometimes they do sales or like flash things or whatever, you can spend like ten fifteen bucks to get the basic like starter kit with like it comes with a tiny ship and like just access to the game just so you can read the forums. That's pretty entertaining sometimes. <laughs> Um, so you're saying spend 10 bucks to read the forums, spend 10 bucks to read the forums <laughs> and get the newsletters. Like that's pretty great. Like some of that stuff, because, because they'll should, you know, it was like, like the, all the roadmap stuff they send out. It's like, that is the same thing you sent two months ago. It's not changed. Nothing's getting any better. Um, do you think it'll ever be astounding. finished? Like even squadron 42. I think like if I had to like put money on it and I did, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, my guess right now would be that like Squadron 42, like they'll put out like chapter one. Okay. They'll, 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 at some point they will announce it's going to be like episodic, uh -huh. right? And they'll put out chapter one with like four or five missions, two of which will work properly. And then they'll spend a year fixing the other three. And then we'll never see another chapter again. I mean, watching this B-roll, I could see why you invested in it because it is right in your wheelhouse. It's oh, like yeah. jump in a ship, oh, yeah. leave the hangar, go out into space, dogfight, find another ship, jump out of your ship, go into that ship, fight a bunch of dudes, get back out, oh, get yeah. back it's, to your it's, ship. Uh, conceptually, it is definitely my jam. Yeah. But um, look, like, in, like oh, that's the other thing is like at the time, in 2012, like nothing else looked like that. You know, But now, by the time Star Citizen, if it were to come out, if, even if Star Citizen came out by the end of this generation, it would look the same as everything else. Yeah. You know, it was a generational leap, but we've passed that generation already. And... You know, I'm I'm interested in what the Star Squadron 42 story might be, but it's like at this point, like, are you going to release this thing before half the cast dies? Right. Because a lot of those guys are getting up there. <laughs> it may be a eulogy for all the for the cast. <laughs> there, look, put it this way: there is a regular, a regularly raised topic on the Star Citizen forums is how to pass your account to us to next of kin. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. <laughs> People oh, have wow. died waiting for this game wow. to come out. Wow. Yeah. Everyone stay far away from this game. <laughs> Just run away. <laughs> I mean, read about it. Yeah. Like, I, I can't wait for the Noclip documentary. Oh, <laughs> my like, gosh. You think uh, they'll never let them do it? There's a lot of tell-all books in here. Like, it's, uh, it's a thing. But, um, yeah, have, uh, Jeff Keeley should do Last Days of Star Citizen. It's just the last <laughs> job he ever takes. This is the last 25 years of his life. Matt, is this a cautionary <laughs> tale to leave. for crowdfunding and Kickstarter and whatnot? No. No? No. This is a unique and weird situation that could only have arisen in this circumstance. What red flag should people look for in the future to Chris avoid Roberts. getting involved in stuff like this? Other <laughs> Chris than Roberts. Just him. Really? You should look for Chris Roberts. 
because there's no, there's nothing else like this. No one's yeah. done anything else like this. This is this is a unique situation. Um, and you, you know, anytime you do some kind of Kickstarter thing, you always got to look at how realistic it seems that you're gonna like, you know, you're talking about a project that could get finished. The, the trick with Star Citizen is that you're dealing with a guy who made five Wing Commander games, and it seemed like he probably could get it finished. Yeah, but I mean, but. You know, I don't but fault it, you for like jumping in. I it's like why can't he get this done? He made a bunch of other games, like and he has had all the money he needs. Like it's mm-hmm. crazy, dude. Like at a certain point, is there anything legally people can do? No, because like part of the whole deal with Kickstarter and with the thing you you agree to when you donate stuff to, they're donations. That's the thing is they're all donations. Um, There's no expectation of return. Right. You are agreeing to throw your money in a hole and hope a spaceship <laughs> comes out, out one day. <laughs> yeah. That's nuts, dude. I, I feel That's for it. you because I know you put a good bit of money into this. So Yeah, I mean I don't I don't miss it. It's been almost ten years. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, it, it's fine. I'm sorry. Um, but I'm certainly not going to do put any more in. Um, I would be thrilled if if it happened one day. But I you know I'm periodically I log into the the server or whatever and see what they're doing and then you know, I do. Have that you about ever once been pleasantly surprised? No, I've, I've been in a couple like, well, once a year, and like it's yeah. just the same bullshit. It's just this buggy piece of shit that isn't anything I could call an actual game with no sense of what the actual through line of things would be. For and for a lot, you know, and the the weird thing about Star Citizen is there's a lot of people that that are super into it. That their big obsession is minutia and time sinks and wasting time as part of a, a form of like verisimilitude and immersion. You're talking about people that like insist that there must be a penalty if you don't have your character go shit regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, people that like, you know, I mean, early look at on that bureau, you, would, you can definitely see that. Yeah. Like, early on, you would yeah. wake up in your, in your, your apartment in the star, in the space state, in the, in the, the, you know, the colony on the planet. And then you'd have to go to the spaceport. And law lo- and pick your ship and get a little like fetch quest mission and fly off and do the thing and come back and turn it in. And there's no shortcut. You have to walk and get on a train <laughs> and then transfer trains to get to the train that takes you to the spaceport and then get to the spaceport and take all the stairs and the escalators and get you to the spaceport. And like it could take like 30 to 40 minutes to get from your apartment to the spaceport. And I'm like, who has time for this after so work? It like, sounds why like do you the wanna... backers and the fans are helping send it down the rabbit hole. Oh, for to sure. Where it will never oh, yeah. be finished. It yeah. is. It is largely catering to a group of weird grognard, like rich. I don't know. They, like they literally want to. <laughs> they literally want to live in this world. They right. they want to simulate. There was there was a thing where like there's a there's a weird contingent. It's a minority, but it's a weird contingent that insists there needs to be chattel slavery as an economic system and that you should be able to put players in it. And people are like, no, if, if I can't force other players who are new to the game to like swab the decks and clean start clean, like, and clean like the colony floors before they earn the right to fly a spaceship in maybe a year, it's a terrible game. Wow. And I'm like, what do you think? It's Who's going to play this it's shit? Doomed. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Like the what's with going the to come out is going, shots. what's going to come out is going to be so impenetrable to someone that isn't already immersed in what this is. It's going to, people are going to bounce off it like a, like a quarter off of the witcher's ass. It's just not <laughs> going to, not going to resonate with anything. It's, um, it reminds me, you may not, you may or may not remember this. Do you remember, uh, it's a guy named Derek Smart. Yes, I do know Derek. I used, I used I used to know him on a forum, and so he's actually a really good guy. Oh, he's a, a friend of mine. On, he actually is a friend of mine on Facebook. Yeah, he's he's actually a fun dude. If you if you ever hang out with Derek Smart, he's a fun guy. But he made this series of games called Battle Battle Cruiser, uh, Battle Cruiser three thousand. Yeah, uh, Universal became Universal Combat at one point, mm-hmm. and they are super super detailed capital ship spaceship uh, simulations. To the point that if you haven't read like a technical manual about how to operate this spaceship the size of an aircraft carrier, you are not going to understand how to start the game. <laughs> and no thanks. Uh, and he uh, and if people would try to play it because like again, it's like that's my shit. I've tried to play every game he ever made, and I've never gotten more than ten minutes into it because none <laughs> of it makes any goddamn sense to me because it's just so esoteric. And like this button doesn't do what you think, and nothing's labeled. It does, there's no help at all. Uh-huh. But it's the same kind of thing. He has this game in his head he wants to make. He has made it over and over and over. It's never been what he wanted exactly, but he's always tried over and over to make this thing. And Star Citizen reminds me of that. 
with the exception that Derek Smart shipped a bunch of games. Right. That's the difference. He actually got some product out and people could look at it and say like, this is my thing. This is not my thing. Um, and he did actually sue star citizen at one point. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember what it was. I think it was, I think it was for fraud or something. I think he did try to like sue on like a, almost a class action kind of thing. Um, I'm surprised I don't more people exactly. haven't because not everyone is like exactly a whale was. that's cool with like waiting 25 but he, years. He did go after them at one point and I was kind of like, I'm interested to see where this goes. Cause it's like, the hating Derek Smart became kind of a meme in the early 2000s on the on the gaming world of the internet, I guess PC gaming internet, and like um, that. While I didn't enjoy the Battle Cruiser games, like I super appreciated what he was doing because yeah. he was making what he wanted. You know, it was his passion project. He was making what he wanted to play, and he was not compromising on that, except where money forced him to. He was not compromising creatively in he any way. Got the way. games done. And he, he did ground <laughs> combat at one That's point. A big he, got, difference. he was trying. He was trying to make yeah. this game 15, 16, 20 years ago. Yeah. And he actually, for as broken as some of it was, he did actually ship it. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's a difference there. But it does remind me of that to some degree. In this, in this, like, this is an incredible undertaking. It may never actually turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. And even if it does, who is it for? Yep. So there you go. That's Star Citizen. Stay far, far away, folks. Stay frosty. <laughs> Stay. Yes. <laughs> Although again, again, if you can, if you can throw like a cheap amount of money just to get access to the forums, it's it's a it's a it's a ride. Not a ride worth however amount of money no. you've spent I mean, on it, though. I guarantee I don't think. There's, probably a, there's probably a Twitter account that just posts the best of the Star Citizen forum screenshots or something. It's somewhere you can probably find that on Twitter. I yeah. imagine. All right, so there you go. Stay far away from that. But Matt, according to you, not something that should scare you off from crowdfunding other projects. No, this is this is an absolutely unique situation. Like I can't imagine how you, I can't even if I could think of a way to replicate getting three hundred fifty million dollars out of people <laughs> over ten years, I'd have done it by now. <laughs> All right, there you go. Put it that way. All right, it's time to get some Q and A. You have some questions for us. Always go at Sifted Games during the Q and A. It makes it easy for us to find your questions. Uh, here's one from Commander Fett. Uh, what do you, Commander? Yeah, what do you think about the Apex Legends Switch port? Uh, do you think this will make other publishers not want to port their games to Switch until a more powerful version comes? Uh, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, Apex Legends runs like crap on the Switch. Uh, Matt, are you surprised by that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not surprised either. Um, I think a lot of people. Put it this, way. this this past week was this yeah was this past week. Uh, there's that game uh, Illus- Illusion Chronicles or by the Suikoden people. You know that? It's a yeah. Kickstarter. Yep. That. Yeah. They sent out a note to all of the backers that basically said, we know we said it was going to be, it's going to be maybe on PC only, but we want to bring it to other platforms. And we're just like, we're just warning you if Nintendo hasn't put out better hardware by the time this game is done, probably Switch not isn't on, happening. on Switch. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it, it was just like, wow. Like that. <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, it was like one of those things is like, yeah, we don't know if this is going to work. You, you, by the time this game is done, you're going to be so outclassed. But uh, it's a thing. Like, there, I, 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 trust me, third-party developers are well aware of the power differential here. Well, I think a lot of people assume that because Doom Eternal came out pretty well, that that was just going to be the way it is. That it's possible, and every other developer is going to be able to figure it out, and that's just not the case. Like, No, every other developer is not id. I think people are starting to understand how magical... The Doom Eternal yeah. is like it literally is like yeah, a magic. Yeah, and train. also like that engine is yeah. magic to yeah. some degree. Like it's you know, the, it, the, programming it, tech is another level. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Johnny Hurricane, thank you for Twitch Prime. Hope you're doing well, man. Um, Aussie Brit two thousand, thank you for Twitch Prime. Also, guys, at the end of the show, always a great time to subscribe with Twitch Prime so we can see it. Uh, Commander Fett also subscribe with Twitch Prime. Uh, Les Devitt, thank you for gifting subs to people. You guys are all flipping awesome. Uh, let's see more questions. AJ the Legend Watson, do you think we'll ever get a Masters of the Universe game? And if so, do you think it would be in the vein of God of War or something entirely different? Great question. Why don't we have any He-Man games? Like, what's up with that? Um, Who owns I mean, the, the short IP answer- and is sitting on it? The short answer is because uh, there's no He-Man anything else to promote with it. Um, there have been He-Man games, yeah, uh, in the past 15 years, maybe since the last one. 
Um, sounds right? about right. Yeah. Um, there was been a, I remember the Atari 2600 game. Yeah. Um, there was one that, after that, though, I believe. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, there is a Kevin Smith uh, produced He-Man reboot coming up uh, for Netflix. Uh, it is uh, is actually a continuation of the old 80s show. Really? It's going to be, I mean, they said continuing off of the, the lore, but I'm just like, was there lore for that? Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't remember an off through line narratively on that series, but okay. Um, but they are picking, it's not going to be like a reimagining like she was. It's going to be a literal pickup where the 80s show wow. left off thing. Um, I don't and know if that's so a good idea. There theoretically could be a, you know, a, a game tie-in with that one. I'll bet you they're going to be in Fortnite. Um, <laughs> they probably will be. What is up, yeah, though? Isn't it funny that, like, He-Man is this 80s icon? I mean, you can still go to, like, a Hot Topic and get, like, a He-Man or a Skeletor shirt. But mm-hmm. as far as it being represented in pop culture, it's completely disappeared. Why is that? Um, I mean, it's not that I, good. I don't know if you've gone back and watched an old episode of He-Man. No, I mean, He-Man has been around. It's, you know, there's still figures of it. Uh, Last Masters of the Universe game was was 2005. So I was almost PS, dead on 15 on years PS2. ago. <laughs> PS2 game. Yeah, I remembered it. Yep. Um, I have never played that. Interesting. <laughs> um, I think part of it is like it's always been a bit of a niche. Um, like Thundercats. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thundercats has had more luck. Um, yep. Part of the problem is... Uh, and like one of the things you're looking you, when you look at like kind of that versus like Transformers and how that's sort of like persisted a little better. A um, uh, part of that is because uh, Transformers toys are made by Hasbro and Mass of the Universe toys are made by Mattel. Yeah. And Mattel has had a much harder time getting the pipeline to collectors, getting 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 product in stores, frankly, uh, and in the end has settled for the Master of the Universe collection lines have mostly been direct sale stuff online through the Maddie Collector website, whereas Hasbro's Transformers line has been a retail success in m- large big box stores and, and mass retail. Um, so you've got a lot more money at changing hands and a lot more freedom to continue to promote the brand. Also, Michael Bay made a bunch of movies of Transformers and the, the only movie we have for Master of the Universe is not great. Yeah, I mean, um, Transformers have, has managed to be able to keep making new toys also, yeah. whereas He-Man, what you got is what you got. Like, Well, He-Man has had new toys forever. Like, uh, they, they've rebooted the series twice, once in the early 2000s as well, where they made, they put them in space for some reason. It was like, it was like a Flash Gordon <laughs> thing. And then they redid it again, like more as like a standard He-Man thing. But you can, if you know where to look, you can go get, Really good, like masterpiece versions of He-Man's, the old He-Man characters. All I mean, just talk to John French about that. John French is a big, you know, our old editor from G4, yep. uh, huge He-Man fan, uh, and knows about this better than I do. But um, it's out there. It's just it's all targeted at people our age. It's targeted at people our age who grew up with it, because um, none of the other stuff really caught on. Yeah, it doesn't seem like um, the kids really part, care about He-Man all that much. Right, and that's part of the problem is there's just no reason for kids to care about it. Uh, it's not There's no animated series to grab onto, at least not since the mid-2000s. There's no games. There's no product on the shelves because it's all done directly to collectors through Matt Mattel's website. Um, it's just not a presence. And when you want to remake, if you talk about, like, let's remake, he let's do a He-Man reboot movie, people are going to either look at the Dolph Lundgren movie and be like, no. Uh, or they're going to look at the property and be like, why do we need to pay for a license for a big, strong guy with a sword? Like, yeah. we, we could just make that make ourselves. Our yeah, he is pretty generic, let's be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I get, you know, we'll see if this Kevin Smith thing takes off. Um, I, I'll take a look at it. I like the She Ra reboot. Um, I don't know how interested I am in just continuing where we left off from the 80s with He Man. That <laughs> was, especially if it's the same animation. If you're just going to reuse that same running animation over and over again, like the the old, uh, yeah, the, the loop filmation. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know exactly that, that weird, like, jump thing. Yeah, he did. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the punch at the camera that just yeah. he did at that every episode. It was the uh, Lou, Sh- Lou Sh- I think it was Lou Shimer, was it Shiner or something? Was that was the name of the guy who ran that uh, that studio? That guy was a master at recycling animation to save money. That was that was their whole business model. Um, 
Also, did you know that the heat, you know, everyone remembers the He-Man theme, right? The, 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 the music, yeah. the opening theme. That th- that music was actually written for a 70s cop show uh, that never what? went to series. <laughs> they, they, they composed it and recorded it and the whole thing. And it, they, they just had it laying around and they bought the rights to it and stuck the He-Man thing on top of it. And that was how man, that that show got an awesome theme song was because it was written for a primetime cop drama. Unreal. Uh, so Jose if you listen to, He-Man, listen to the He-Man theme and try to imagine like, Seven, late seventies, early eighties, cop characters like poking around the corner and stuff, like T.J. Hooker. That's what that music was composed to do, uh, and you can see it if you think about it. Okay, um, uh, Jose Holiday, thank you for Twitch Prime. Um, Aussie Brit two thousand, thank you for Twitch Prime. Um, Erebus Jones, how do you feel about the change of genre for the new Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance game? Exciting or a bit disappointing? I wasn't aware of that actually. What did they do? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that to? is. I don't, Dark I Alliance changed that. genre. Yeah, was, is it not a is not that. a Diablo kind of game? I don't know. Still, still described as a third person action role playing game. I mean, that's that's what, that's what Dark, Dark Alliance it was. was. Be, yeah, maybe you can give us more context. Third person action. I mean, that's what it always was. Or do you mean is it like the camera behind the shoulder now? Or I don't know. I didn't hear anything about that. I didn't see it on Sifted either. Uh, here's one from Check. Lynn Jeff ninety nine. Um, I couldn't watch watch Ask Shane anything live episode, but wanted to. How did it go? <clears throat> Nobody showed up. That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna have to like rethink things uh, because one, it's it was cordoned off to only people who are pledging at that amount or higher. So that. Literally, the bulk of our patrons are at four dollars a month. Um, so, well, there most of our audience would just cut off from it in the first place. Um, trying to promote it and message it, I don't know if I got the word out well enough. I did mention it in Game Face, and we did promote it on the site, and we did promote it on the Patreon the day before and the day of. We hardly got anybody to participate. So, um, mm-hmm. if you guys can think of a better way to handle that going forward, a way that you guys will want to show up or will show up, uh, leave it in the comments on Sifted or on Patreon, because we want to get you guys involved. I'll say this. I mean, it still lasted an hour. <clears throat> the people that did show up had great questions, and I think the answers were pretty good. Uh, an archive of that should be going up here pretty soon, uh, but just not a lot of people showed up. That was really the major problem. So um, I had fun doing it, uh-huh. and we're going to keep doing it every second Saturday of the month. So if you can think of a better way to make sure people show up, and maybe once you guys watch it and you see how it goes, you'll be more apt to show up. Maybe some of you guys were apprehensive because you're like, I don't want to be on camera or whatever. Uh, but maybe once you see it, uh, when it, the archive goes up, you'll be more apt to do it. Uh, the new trailer went up for Baldur's Gate today, and oh. it's basically, basically it's it's a behind the character action game now instead of a Diablo isometric thing. Gotcha. Um, I prefer that, so I am fine with that. Yeah, I'm totally cool with that too. Honestly, um, I think that's probably a more modern way to handle it. I would have been okay with yeah. isometric as well, but um, yeah, I would have been fine with that. But I think uh, this has is going to have an easier and wider mass appeal. Yeah. Um, and if you and want it looks more good. games, like, which is probably something you're hoping for, like us, then it's probably for the best. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking. Like, I'm looking at it right now, uh, and like, yeah, looks looks good to me. It looks like God of War, actually, perspective wise. Yeah, at a certain point on show days, we're not going to know what you're talking about. And for me, that's around 10:30 a.m. Pacific. Uh, once I hit that point, I'm like here setting up for the show not paying attention to what's going on so that's probably why it slid under the radar for us um here we go el guapo 3385 matt what's your hype meter for the snyder cut and falcon and winter soldier uh hype meter for the snyder cut is like below ground i agree with that um i I mean i'm gonna watch it just because it's part of the zeitgeist but like i could not possibly just seems like a lower expectation to me um, I mean, it's a publicity stunt that cost him a hundred million dollars. Why? Um, th- by the way, uh, Justice That's League. Insane. When you when you take into full account, Justice League is the most expensive movie ever made. Now, really? <laughs> because Snyder of the extra hundred that they just yeah, tacked on. Snyder spent three hundred million dollars on it before he left the project. Whedon spent another seventy to one hundred million in reshoots, and now he's spent another seventy to one hundred million in his Snyder cut reshoots. So we're talking about about a five hundred million dollar movie now. For for what? For what? For what? That is a perfect example of throwing good money after bad. 
Yeah. Um, but what at about? least it came out unlike Star Citizen. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, just, I have never liked a Zack Snyder movie. I've seen all of his movies. I kind of like the owl one, I guess. Uh, but I've never liked a Zack Snyder movie. I do not expect this to change my mind. Uh, it will probably be better than the one that came out in theaters, but that movie was terrible, too. Um, whatever. I expect it to be a lateral move. Falcon and Winter Soldier, I'm excited for because I like uh, both those actors in those characters and their antagonistic relationship to each other in Civil War. Um, if it's just a series, it's entirely like the two of them bickering with each other, like they were in the car in Civil War. I'm happy with that. Um, I like WandaVision okay, uh, but I think um, I'm kind of ready for a more standard issue Marvel series, you know? Like, I'm kind of like, oh, it's just going to be them it. running around doing spy stuff and throwing shields. And so I'm like, kind of, I'm kind of good with that, that at this point. Yeah. Um, WandaVision was a pretty big curveball, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. I think it was yeah, a good I, I liked it. I appreciate what they're after for it, but I'm kind of like, I don't know. I'm ready for some Marvel meat and potatoes now. Yeah. Uh, I don't that, think you're seems like, I think, you know, it's also notable that, that this was supposed to be the first one like Falcon Winter Soldier was supposed to come first, like last August, uh, before WandaVision. WandaVision was not meant to kick off the you know Disney, Disney Plus Marvel shows, but it just happened to because they finished it first because the pandemic. They had to finish shooting locate on location, I think, in Prague, in for Falcon Winter Soldier. They couldn't do that until like November. Okay, <laughs> JM Rain, thank you for uh, all the tier the uh, tier one subs you're giving out to our viewers. That's freaking awesome. Uh, we'll answer one more question. Um, here's a good one from Congrim1. What games are on your hard drives that you haven't played in a very long time but refuse to uninstall because you think or want to go back to someday? Matt, you can go first. I don't. I don't you don't have time for that. <laughs> well, you promise. can just list one. Um, on the top of mind. I mean, up until today, I probably would have said Skyrim, but I did play it today. Um, the other one, I guess, would probably be Final Fantasy fourteen. Like one of these days, I'll get around to it, get up to sh- and play Shadowbringers, but I just haven't. Okay. It's hard to sit down and really commit to an MMO these days. I mean, I'll never do that. <laughs> That's never <laughs> gonna happen. I don't know what it would take at this point, Matt, for me to play an MMO because I've had so many people say this is the one you're gonna like. Like, give this one a chance. It's different, and I try them, and like an hour in, I'm like, nope, I'm not gonna stick with it. Um, yeah, I mean, Final Fantasy fourteen is um, better than most that I've played. Yeah. Um, but like, I mean, I'm gonna I don't play PSO two actually. I'm gonna give that a go. That's kind of an PSO two is much more is an action game though, yeah. so it's it's more your Not your really thing. Yeah. I mean, Final Fantasy fourteen does a pretty good impression of an action game, but you're still pressing buttons and waiting for the attack to happen. Yeah. Like, it's still MMO, but it feels actiony. Um, the thing I like about Final Fantasy fourteen just I haven't gotten to the stuff everybody says is the good stuff. I'm just still working my way through the vanilla stuff. But the thing I did like about it was it had a real sense of place. And when I went back to certain cities and towns, it felt like a city. It felt like a town. Reporting to people in the bureaus felt like I was telling someone something that they hadn't seen before that I was reporting from this big, wide world. Like there was a, There's a sense of scale and place in Final Fantasy XIV that a lot of MMOs never managed to capture. And I appreciate that. Um, I can see why people like it so much. Uh, it's still kind of a slog right now. Uh, in terms of, I, I go back <laughs> to it every every couple of weeks to try to make more progress to get to this stuff that everybody says is so amazing. Yeah, and it's just it's just taking a while. Yep. Uh, for me, it is the Demon Souls remake on my PlayStation Five. Mm. It is still mm. on my hard drive. I do not have the heart to delete it because I and that's, want that's valuable real estate. It is, but I want to play it, man. And like, I've been teasing myself. Like, I've been going on YouTube and watching like some parts of it. Like, and I. I I don't know if I'm doing it because I want to convince myself to go back and play it or if I'm doing it because I'm, I know I'm never going to go back and play it. But it has sat on my hard drive all this time on my PlayStation 5 hard drive, and I just cannot delete it because I, I do like it. It's just so disheartening when you die and you have to go all the way back to the beginning again. Um, and I will say this. like I feel like I'm better at it than I am at a lot of From Software games, even though this wasn't technically developed by from um it's i can't delete it i it just it keeps sitting there and trust me i have looked at it so many times like i i installed the division 2 on my ps5 and i had to delete a lot of stuff to make room for it and i had to make hard decisions and i like i couldn't get rid of it i just it's still there and i just i don't know 
Maybe it may not make the cut much longer. Um, but you know what? Everything's really dry right now. Maybe I should go back and give it another try and give it another go. I've watched enough of people playing it on YouTube now that I honestly feel like I'm probably would be a lot better at it than I was when I first started playing it and started trying to play it. Um, so that's the game for me. That's just been sitting there, and every time I install something new and I have to delete something, I look at it and I'm like, I can't, I won't, and I don't. So for me, it's the Demon Souls remake. It's just so damn pretty. Um, and I know it's a really good game that I feel like I should give more of a chance to than I have. So I just have not managed to be able to uh, take it off of my hard drive yet, and uh, I'll keep you updated, and I'll let you know if I actually go back and play it. That might be a good thing for me to stream, mm-hmm. honestly, uh, me playing the Demon Souls remake. Uh, people seem to like Shane versus uh, Dark Souls way back in yeah. the day. Shane versus oh, Demon and- Souls might be even better. <laughs> Oh, and speaking of going back to play things that you probably wouldn't play, I, I, I put something real dumb in this week. Uh, feast your eyes on that act of violence. Wow. <laughs> who remembers Who remembers X-Men Destiny? Not a lot of people. The game that got pulled from shelves because, uh, what, what was it, Silicon Knights went down in flames? Yep. Were and you they, able they were, like, to play it? Like, is it assets playable in this still? thing or something? Yeah. Wasn't that it? They used like Unreal assets that were not <laughs> yep. like licensed or something. Yep. Were you yeah, able to play it? Out. Yeah, I was. I was playing it. Uh, it's still bad. Did you <laughs> install it on your Series X? No, I put it on my 360. It's not backwards compatible. Uh, okay, and it probably never will be because never will be. No, <laughs> it's illegal. <laughs> All right, that's it for Game Face episode 248. I can't believe the show ended up being three hours. I'm really shocked at that. I didn't think when I looked at the rundown today we were going to be able to get to it, uh, but somehow we did. Um, we always well, we talked for like 40 minutes about Ninja Turtles, so we, we got did. there. Sometimes we go down the nostalgia rabbit hole and we ramble a little bit, but I, I have think a feeling. The whole segment we say like four sentences about the actual video the game. New and the, rest, the new one. The new one. We hardly talked about it. <laughs> We talked about the old one and why Ninja the old Turtles one still and matter. The ninja stars and bringing yeah. nunchucks to school. And <laughs> well, the good news is everyone who watches Game Face or is on Sifted or on our Patreon, they're older like us, and I think they appreciate that kind of discussion. Uh, it feels good to talk about the old days sometimes. We don't do it that often, but uh, for something like this, I think it's okay. So anyway, that's episode 248. If you're listening to this show out on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else, or you may find it, or if you're watching the archive on YouTube and you want to support us, we really appreciate it if you could, if you would, and you should. Head to patreon.com slash sifted. That's S-I-F-T-D. Uh, and if you can't afford to support us and you want to know when stuff goes up for free, you'll probably want to follow the site on Twitter, and that's at Sifted Games. If you want to holler at me on Twitter, I am at Dinfire. And if you want to find Matt, he is at M Kyle. That's M-K-E-I-L. So on behalf of Matt, I uh, just want to thank you guys for tuning in for the live stream here on Twitch, which you can find every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash siftedgames. We'll see you next Tuesday. Game Face is up and out.